Mm -hmm. Okay, hold on one second. Let's make sure we're going live. There we go. Making sure LinkedIn went live. Okay, guys, bear with me. guys what's up welcome to another episode of tier talk so i'm trying to get what people want so i haven't getting emailed and somebody mentioned ganji we know that inmates are innovative so how do they make weapons how do they make alcohol so me and russ have covered these videos before i thought what would be cool today is that i'm going to show you two very unique videos one video is going to be how inmates can make alcohol out of hand sanitizer and that was a big thing during covid because in COVID, they wanted us to give the inmates sanitizers uh, with alcohol. And uh, me and Russ were quick to do a video to let you know why that may not be such the best idea. Because inmates are able to make pure drinking alcohol from sanitizer. So we're going to show you how that's made. And then what we're also going to do is we got a video of some of the weapons that Russ found in his career working in a prison. And he's going to explain exactly how these weapons were made. And I believe it's very innovative. I mean, these inmates, the more restrictive the environment, the more innovative they become. And again, what we're going to do, I'm going to get Russ on. We're going to do a little intro together. And then we're going to play the first video, chat about it. And then we'll play the second video and chat about it. But in the process, when the videos are playing, me and Russ are also going to be in the comments answering questions and taking notes. So when the videos are done, we can go back and answer some of the questions that we felt would be better for a discussion. So I think this is pretty cool. And it gives us a chance to look at some of the material uh, that we did a while ago that actually still holds true, obviously, right now. And also, guys, before I bring in Russ, I'll let you know two upcoming episodes I think that you guys are going to find very interesting. One is I'm going to have Sean Grogan on. He's the author of a book about body language. And he's going to give us some... Uh, tips and pointers of what we need to look for uh, when it comes to body language, certain signs that, that the person's a threat, whatnot. I think it's going to be a great dialogue. I'm going to have him committed very soon. Uh, we're in the process. I'll probably know more about that next week. And also Dr. Ann Salter. She's the author of a book called Predators. Guys, it's a phenomenal book, uh, but it's not an easy read. It, you're going to be reading stuff that is very hard to take in, but it's needed. Because, again, she gets into the mind of sex offenders, why they do what they do. Uh, I'm going to actually finish rereading the book again. I've been working on it now. I think Alicia B is also rereading it. It's a phenomenal read. And I'm probably going to have her on the show within about a week or two. She's out of the country, but she's all ready to come on. I just got to wait for her to come back uh, from where she's at. So, again, guys, that's a great book called Predators. Dr. Anna Salter. And we're going to talk about how psychologists work with sex offenders. And I think it's going to be pretty unique. And guys, there's no one as good, literally, as Dr. Anna Salter. She pretty much is a pioneer in this profession. So to have her on and then to have it live so we can interact with her, I think that's pretty good. So if you guys want, you may want to get the book ahead of time so you know what questions to ask. I know Alicia B is already on top of that. And uh, okay, so let me get Russ on real quick. Hold on, let me bring him on. What's up, Russ? Anthony, how's it going, man? I am so happy to be here. I just feel all relaxed. I'm not standing up and getting ready to, you know, do a long show. We're going to kind of let some of the heavy lifting be done by our previous videos. And yet we're going to be here to guide people along the way and, you know, give them some insights into what it's like to work in some of these, uh, you know, really uh, intense and violent uh, environments. Yes, and, and and like what Steve said, metal from mop buckets, tables, doors. Yep, we're going to be mentioning all that. And Melissa mentioned actually hooch. Alcohol is made by sugar, orange juice, and some type of pineapple or fruit. Yeah, I mean, I'll show I'll show you a video later today if you guys remind me about the hooch. I just want to I show got, you. Oh, go ahead. I have. Right. I was going to tell you. I, I have a saying about hooch that uh, that uh, a lot of people enjoy this particular saying. But when I talk about making hooch, 
I say that you have to know what the basis for your formula is, and that is that yeast eat sugar and shit alcohol. Mm. That is delicious. Uh, and by the way, they'd, be, they'd be making hooch in toilets, guys. Um, yeah, I, we'll, we'll probably break down hooch. I just want to show you guys how uh, inmates can extract alcohol from the hand sanitizer. Hey, hey, Russ, real quick, do you mind introducing yourself to our audience? Oh, not at all. Um, so anyway, I'm Russ Hamilton. Uh, I am a former and retired sergeant from California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. I also, after I retired, I went to work for a, a local juvenile detention facility here. And then after that, um, I went to work for a private company and we do um, reentry and rehabilitation work with those that are on parole or probation. Uh, depending for a local uh, probation department here in California. And I also work uh, for that same company inside a jail as the jail case manager for those doing reentry and rehabilitation. And thank you for all you do, Russ. Right now we are about 50 in the room, which is great. Uh, they're asking if Russ has his hat on back. Hey, Russ, real quick, people are asking how much do you weigh? I mean, how much do you bench? Sorry. How much do you bench? How much do I bench? Um uh, you know, I, I kind of like, um, I don't go for the mat stuff anymore because I tore my uh, shoulder completely out. And so um, I'm more about, uh, you know, what I can do as far as uh, volume because of that. You know, like uh, today on my, today when I was working out, I started out with a, a hundred pounds, not on the bench, but just on the curls. And so I do three sets of, uh, three sets at a hundred, three sets at 80, three sets at 60, uh, five sets at 40 and then five sets at 40 again. And then, uh, that's my warm up. So I'm doing pretty good. Yeah. And, and, and guys, so we're going to get this started. So guys, so this, this is just going to show you how innovative inmates can be. Now, mind you, if they're innovative, staff have to be more resourceful. So you're going to see, even in the second video, when we talk about the weapons, how, you know, inmates will get more innovative and Russ has to get more resourceful in finding these weapons. I actually have another video that shows you where they they can hide weapons. And obviously they're not the easiest of places to find. But first, what I would like to show you guys, if you're ready for it, just let me know. Uh, I'd like to show you how inmates can pretty much make pure alcohol out of hand sanitizer. Now, this is a video that Russ did probably about a little over a year ago. Uh, it's it's probably close to a hundred thousand views by now. Um, it's 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 a pretty uh, it's a pretty detailed video. But again, just to let you see this process, Russ is going to lead the way. He's the scientist in corrections. All right, guys. So again, guys, this is just inmates being innovative. So now imagine staff. We have to always constantly step up the game. Okay. So and guys, while we're watching the video. You can comment your questions on the side. We're going to be very active in the comment board. And then when the video is done, if there's any questions that we want to pick up for a little bit of a discussion before the next video, we will. All right. So let me get this first video in there. This is how to make alcohol with hand sanitizer. Hi everyone, I'm Russ Hamilton. I'm a retired sergeant with California Department of Corrections and Rehabilitation. Hi, my name is Russ Hamilton. I'm a retired sergeant from California Department of Corrections. Um, doing this video at the behest of Anthony Ganji and Tear Talk. Uh, the other night, um, Anthony and I, we did uh, a little spa on uh, inmates, inmates and alcohol. alcohol. Uh, um, basically, basically a little, little spot, spot on two, on two yahoos that ended up, ended up drinking, drinking some hand sanitizer, hand sanitizer getting front, front, stealing, stealing an ATV, going on, on a joyride, joyride that, that sort, sort of thing. thing. So this is a follow-up to that, and this is going to be a little bit more instructional on um, inmates and alcohol. So basically, um, in the correctional setting, there's three ways inmates can get their hands on alcohol. And that's, uh, first of all, they can manufacture it. Second of all, they can smuggle it in. Third of all, they can uh, uh, use what I call non-conventional sources to get a hold of it. So um, anytime you've got alcohol inside a uh, institutional setting like that, it's really, really dangerous. Can't emphasize enough uh, the number of uh, fights and riots and uh, assaults on staff and that sort of thing that I've seen over the years, the drunks that I've had to fight and uh, break apart from fighting at each other and that sort of thing. But it brings me back to a, um, a story in recognizing 
the type of uh, security threat that this is. Uh, I was in a dorm one time, caught a couple of inmates drinking. It was obvious that at least one of them was drunk. Um, I told my officer who was with me to start handcuffing the one guy. He handcuffed that guy. I handcuffed the other. I got some people down. We ended up escorting them out, finding six or eight gallons of alcohol. Um, took them down to start, you know, to, you know, to see how inebriated they were and to uh, wait to see how long it would be before I brought them back onto the unit. Well, uh, anyway, while this was going on, the officer approached me and said, hey, that was just Pruno. And uh, so Pruno is our name for inmate manufactured alcohol, of course. And um, what this officer was doing, he was he was very young in his profession and he was mirroring mirroring some of the other stuff that he'd seen um other staff react to and these staff apparently weren't as hip to the problems that, that causes as well um alcohol in the correctional setting is very serious um, and it causes all kinds of violence so when i ran it down to him the things that it could cause the fact that we could get into fights with those inmates if we let them back on the unit they could cause um fights in their dorms and stuff uh broken jaws, uh, sliced up uh, faces, all that kind of stuff that I've seen from the results of this, then he kind of understood. And um, alcohol is something I would never take lightly, um, especially inside. This was, this was inside a dorm, so it was a much bigger, um, much bigger uh, safety issue. So anyway, uh, to get on with fighting that, um, and starting with the first part of this video, we're going to talk about uh, manufacturing and uh, some of the detection processes of it. First of all, um, when inmates manufacture alcohol, basically it's a process that uses sugar and yeast. And the ways that they get yeast are you can get it directly from bread. Um, I've had inmates tell me that they get it from their toe jam. I don't know how real that is or whatever, but just a little bit of uh, information for you there. But um, anyway, the basic thing is, is that you have to have sugar. Um, tomato paste is a is a great way for them to it has high in sugar content. Um, you know, sometimes some forms of Kool-Aid, that sort of thing. We try to remove all sugar and sugar products because, you know, even candy can supply the sugar. So basically, you've got sugar and then you've got uh, alcohol and the in-between actor is yeast. So uh, yeast, basically, it's a little animal that eats sugar and shits alcohol. And so that's the way that you end up getting that. Um, now, when I talk about uh, detecting for this kind of stuff, um, it's a little bit more complicated than just all that. These inmates, they have to go to great lengths to cut up pieces of fruit uh, to get as much sugar as they can in different things. And then they'll try and heat all that up because yeast does much better in a really warm environment. And as that stuff heats up, that alcohol will start to ferment and then it makes a really bad smell. And most of you out there that have been doing this for a while, you know what that smell smells like. And it smells horrible. It just smells like, well, it smells like rotting fruit, of course. So anyway, but there's different ways that they go about hiding this. So this is just a quick few little tips on that. Um, you know, the, the obvious places that you look are always in, in trash cans and things like that. But you know what? I have found this stuff um, bagged up and put in the bottom of a mop bucket with dirty water poured over the top of it. I mean, they're serious about being able to, uh, you know, hide their stuff and being able to drink it later. Um, I've seen it where they've actually taken a bag of it and flattened the bag out so flat and put it underneath the door and rolled it all the way under to the other side to a locked door that you would think they won't have any access to, but they can just pull it back out from underneath. And then any other where your imagination can take, I found it in boxes of crackers and uh, hidden inside uh, other, you know, soda bottles and all sorts of things like that. So, you know, it's a it's a crazy, crazy thing. And and as I said before, I'm, I'm going to say over and over and over again, it's really, really dangerous. So uh, anyway, those are just a couple of quick points on that. Um, the smuggling issue with uh, getting uh, alcohol in, not really going to touch on that. That's pretty obvious because um, it's just like any other thing you smuggle in. Probably a little bit more difficult because it's not, not like dope or something like that. Um, but the non-conventional source, that's what we're going to really talk about in this little last part of the video here. Um, in this bit that uh, Anthony and I talked about, 
Um, this was a situation where these guys, somehow they got access to hand sanitizer and that's all it took. Well, the hand sanitizer is really, really, really high in alcohol. And so um, all, all that they had to do now, I don't know if they did this, they may have just drank it down like it was, but it's really, really easy to just get the alcohol out of that stuff right away. All you got to do is put a little bit of salt on it. And after that, all you got to do is drink it because guess what? Salt doesn't dissolve in alcohol. And so, well, you probably would get some of the taste anyway, but these guys, when they're desperate like that, who knows how that they don't care about how they imbibe it, but um, they can do that. Or if they've got time and I've seen this too before, they can do a makeshift still where they keep all that alcohol in a bag. If they can get a piece of tubing or something and wind it around, heat that bag up. Alcohol is way more volatile than water. So it will evaporate first. So you could theoretically distill it out like that. Sometimes they'll do that with their Pruno product as well, but it's more difficult because there's very, very low concentrations inside that Pruno. So anyway, that's just the basis for that. I'm going to pick you up because this is high quality production here. Just show you a quick little. I can go there. If you can see this, this is your chemical formula. That's sugar and that's alcohol. So anyway, I'm not a chemist, but I have read a lot about this stuff and I've chased a lot of uh, Pruno in my life, thousands and thousands of gallons worth. So anyway, in a minute here, I'm going to take you straight to a demonstration. I'm going to help show you how you can distill this stuff directly out of the hand sanitizer gel and be able to drink it down. I'm not going to drink it though. All right, this is Russ Hamilton again. I am back and I am ready to uh, continue on with this little experiment here and this little instructional on inmates and alcohol. So anyway, what I did was, is I went and I got my uh, hand sanitizer there, Daylogic Advanced, um, on the back of it. I couldn't get the camera to focus on it, but I'll tell you that it says that it's 70% uh, alcohol by volume. 70% of alcohol by volume translates to 140 proof for those of you out there that know your alcohol. Now, in this case right here, as you see this, you can see that it's the goop on top. Okay, well, an inmate, in order to prepare this to be drank, really needs to get into a liquid form. The easiest way to do that is to use common ordinary salt. Now this is super iodized, but I don't think that, that makes any difference. But what's gonna happen is, is I'm gonna pour this in there and there's gonna be a reaction and the reaction is gonna be very slow moving. And what's gonna happen is, is the salt is gonna move all the way from the top down to the bottom of the glass and it's gonna leave liquid instead of gel above it. And all of that liquid is gonna be 70% pure alcohol, right? And so people are going to say, well, what, you know, what about the salt? That's going to be pretty nasty. No, it's not going to be nasty because alcohol, for the most part, does not dissolve salt. So this is, this is the way it's done. They could drink that straight, but um, that's not the way I've ever heard of it being done. They could also, uh, theoretically, I've heard of this being done is they could put the liquid remains in a bag and they could evaporate it out using a tube to try and distill it. But I think that would mean that they have a lot more time on their hands than most inmates do. So here we're gonna go with the salt and I'm gonna pour a layer over the top of it. And that layer is gonna progress toward the bottom. Okay, so now we're just gonna be watching it. Now, if you recall a little bit in um, your high school chemistry class, um, the ways that you can increase a reaction, um, you can mix it, you can heat it, or you can add a catalyst. So we don't have any sort of catalyst. And uh, in this case, you could mix it up, but that would break up some of that gel and it would get back into the liquid. And we don't want that to happen. I could heat it up, I could nuke it, but uh, then you wouldn't get to see it. So anyway, as you watch, just watch all the salt's gonna move down and what's left on top, as you can see, as it's starting to go down, 
that liquid being left behind, that's going to be 70% alcohol right there. And that's going to be ready to be drank, ready to be belted down. So anyway, here in a minute, I'll take my fork and I'll show you that it's indeed just regular splashable liquid here. add just a little bit more to this little place on top see that's gonna that's gonna push that's gonna push that whole salt plate down a little bit i don't know if you can see it very well on here but there's a real clear line here between the liquid on top and what's left of the gel here on the bottom this part's starting to sag it's it's going a little bit faster than the rest of it so there it is you can see now it's all starting to move down toward the bottom Now you can see it kind of lumped around there. This wasn't as, this didn't happen as evenly as I would like for it to have because it's left a, it's left a little bit of that uh, gel on top there. I'm going to pour a little bit more on it, push that down. All right. And you see that the rest of that gel is coming out. Now, if I go on top here, you can see that this has become all liquid. All that gel is coming out. See, I can scoop a little bit of those gelatin crystals out still and stuff because that didn't that didn't react as equally as I would have liked for it to have. But now you can see that it's liquid form on the top. A little bit of lumps in there and stuff. That could be taken out with a coffee filter. But as you can see, the reaction was there. So anyway, I hope you guys uh, really liked uh, that little demonstration. Hope you learned a little bit about uh, the methods that Emmett used to get alcohol. Um, I hope you guys will take it very seriously when you do an alcohol interdiction, especially on those special days like the day before Super Bowl or the day of. And I hope you'll all stay safe out there. Hey, You're well, muted. I, I caught it. I caught it. I caught it too. Uh, hey, 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 before we go into the next video about the weapons, I had some questions that came through here uh, that I'd like to okay. ask you. Uh, now, guys, I just want to mention something. The reason why we did this video was around the time of COVID, and a lot of people uh, wanted the inmates to get hand sanitizers with alcohol. And of course, that was like, that's not going to be a good idea because that's going to open up the door for sanitizers to go missing. Trust and believe, guys. We would put sanitizers at all these points, but they would be picked up. And uh, as you said, they, they have access to salt. So it wouldn't be that hard for them to make alcohol as opposed to a little bit of a longer method that it would take to make uh, hooch. Hey, let me ask you a question. Matt said something. Uh, uh, Julie got the mute too. All right, Julie, you get that off. Uh, <laughs> Matt mentioned that would be more than 70% alcohol once this process is complete as it's now more condensed. That's true, right, Russ? Yes, uh, pr probably so. But I, I just don't know what the... I just don't know, don't know what the percentage of the uh, the type of uh, crystals that they use, the silica gel, uh, to blow that stuff up, to put it in its gelatin form is. So all I could do is, you know, take my, what my best guess was at it, but uh, rest assured that that's way, way more potent than any kind of, you know, pruno or homemade ooch that you'll find out there by far. And, and by the way, guys, that may be harder to find, too, because ooch has a color. Uh, this looks clear. So an inmate could probably put it in a water bottle and you would know no different. Correct, Russ? Yeah, it's it could definitely, you know, go for that. Um, it's really, um, I don't know if it has something to do with uh, the gelatin that's in it or what, but it also, it, it lacks almost any smell whatsoever. Um, if you've ever gotten a whiff of hooch, uh, you know, it will make you gag. It will make you wish you could barf even without having to drink it. So, uh, you know, anything that they can do to try and, you know, hide what it is that they're doing, they will. Yeah. And guys, uh, I, Ho Hooch has like a vomit smell. Uh, I've smelled it. it. It literally smells like vomit. Um, yeah. It, it smells like rotting fruit and feet and ass all mixed together. Yeah. It's a delicious thing that you definitely want to try. Uh, but um, so uh, I've got one more thing here. There was a. Uh, let me see something. Hold on. So, guys, we're going to cross into the weapons. The weapons is a longer video, but it's great because Russ doesn't only tell you how the weapons were made, but he's going to tell you how he found them. So it's pretty cool with the 
story behind it. And again, guys, this is just for for knowledge. Uh, anytime, Melissa. This is just for knowledge. Um, you know, I, I think it's great for you guys to get insight into our world. Uh, and then I bring the best on so we can give you the, at least what we feel will be the highest level of insight. So if you guys are ready to see these weapons, uh, it's pretty cool. I like this video. It's one of my favorite videos that uh, Russ did. We do have a dialogue, which is pretty cool, uh, during each discovery. And then, um, I don't know, Russ, you ready to show them some weapons that you found in your career? Absolutely, man. This is this is um, my funnest thing about corrections was uh, anything that had to do with drug interdiction, um, you know, discovery of weapons or uh, finding the cell phones out there. That was like my bread and butter. It was um, a thrill, an absolute thrill to me to, to be able to get in there and find all the stuff that I did over the years. I'm going to ask the crowd if they're ready for the weapon video. If you guys are ready for the weapon video, let me know. I'll pop it in. And uh, six, I can't wait for Ganji to retire so he can give us the 211. Yeah, I got stories, guys. I got stories. Trust me. Uh, this is really cool how they make weapons. I've seen it, and it shocked me how they made them. Yeah, we're going to give you some insight on how they make them. Uh, a little bit different than what you're going to see on TV um, because uh, I, I think it's, it's, the TV, they kind of just they go for the entertainment value. Uh, we go for the truth and 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 knowledge. And guys, I'm going to tell you something, guys. Uh, these inmates could be extremely resourceful. You may think that they have nothing, but they're constantly in survival mode. And we're going to explain this because it's not just about finding the weapons in this video, guys. We have a dialogue that gets you uh, more insight. So I think everybody's ready. Oh, you know what? Let's do this first. Uh, what, let's get a, one question from Brandon. Has any of you ever had a weapon pulled on you? And what is the best way to react? So go ahead, Russ. What's your thoughts on that? Okay, the best way to react is to run, and uh, and I say that there there's there's no there's no shame in you know trying to do your best. If you can't run, then you should you know pull your spray, pull your baton, um, try and uh, grab a hold of the arm, control the arm the best that you can. And um, as far as uh, weapons being pulled, um, I've had that uh, occur in a couple of different situations. Um, I was walking down a row of bunks one night and uh, these guys, I mean, um, I'm not even gonna, I'm not even going to say the, the gang they belong to, but I was having some problems with them at the time. They were a, a white supremacist gang. And man, as I walked past them, I just had a bad feeling. And then all of a sudden, man, I heard something hit the floor and I knew it was a shank and it was just right there. And, uh, you know, I didn't know if they were going to try and pick it up and hit me right then. Uh, but I'd already, you know, got a lot of their, um, I'd got a lot of their phones and dope and stuff like that. And so they were really unhappy with me at the time. And it was, it was a really good shank too. I mean, it was, it was good and solid. Uh, but we'd had, um, we'd had some significant problems with this, with this particular gang. Um, they were uh, they were affiliated with the whites. Um, they weren't they were not Aryan Brotherhood, and they were not uh, they were not skinheads. And that's all I'll really say about that. Uh, but uh, that was one. Um, I had another one where uh, we were having a um, foot pursuit um, actually, and the guy coming toward me actually drew the weapon. Um, I considered briefly. Uh, striking him in the head because I considered that to be, uh, you know, a potential lethal use of force. And I considered it justified. Uh, fortunately, the way it worked is, is actually he went down and stuck the weapon into the ground. And then I waited for help to arrive because I wasn't going to approach him with that. Um, I've had other few instances where weapons were pulled on other people in my presence. Um, I've seen guys get stabbed. I've seen guys get slashed. I've seen, um, I've seen, uh, you know, guys, uh, get shot in the head and all kinds of, uh, crazy stuff. So, you know, uh, weapons are a big deal. Um, the reason that they stock up and they have weapons are of course to go in there and, you know, uh, have a riot deal with, uh, rival gangs. Most of the time, a lot of times they'll also have weapons ready because they want to protect their stashes. They want to protect uh, the dope that they've got. They want to protect, uh, the electronics that they smuggle in like cell phones and also to be able to, you know, carry out, um, you know, carry out the orders of the, of the shot callers. So there's there's a lot to it, and I'm I'm very proud of the fact that that I've uh, you know found so many weapons over the years. 
Yeah, and, and, and guys, real quick. So someone's asking. So Eric, I'm, I'm doing the keynote in California, but not in Atlantic City. Uh, Masca, I'm just doing the uh, a class, I believe. And cheer, guys. I'm watching from Western Australia. I really appreciate any from advice you have for the states. Keep it up. Yeah, it's teamwork, guys. I mean, we're not that far from each other when it comes to what needs to be done. And I want to answer a question real quick from Karen. Um, not all states offer vests to our officers. Crazy, but it's true. Some states, like the state I'm in, we give our officers vests, give our supervisors vests, but some states don't. And I wish that would change. Uh, and I think that's part of the movement that a lot of us, uh, you know, unions, and I know Wendy Callahan was big on that as well. Um, all right, guys. So let's let's have some fun with this dialogue. So again, guys, we're going to play a video. We're going to be in the comment section uh, interacting, and then we'll come back and answer some questions. Okay, so here goes the video on Russ's story, finding weapons and contraband. Here we go. Along the way, we'll show you some of these inmate manufactured weapons. Russ is going to share a story, but more importantly, he's going to provide tips <laughs> along the way. This is why we listen to those with experience. Because when you listen to those with experience, then you yourself get this, get to get some tips or some knowledge that I'm sure, Russ, it took you, what, 27, 28 years to get this type of knowledge? Uh, yeah, you know, and it's it continues to evolve, though. You know, it doesn't stop just because I'm out of that part of the game. Um, you know, I still listen to people. I still uh, take in uh, knowledge and expertise from other people that have done the similar job so I can pass it on to all of you. Right. And guys, just so you know, guys, uh, when you're at a correctional facility, if you start seeing these weapons evolve, so they go from plastic to metal, you guys got to get on point because the first thing we look at when it comes to image, first thing we look at is frontline complacency. Sad to say, but it's true. If inmates are collecting a lot of weapons, the first thing we look at is frontline complacency. Are you doing your integrity checks? Because trust and believe, let's say inmates are taking stuff from the fences. If you guys are doing those integrity checks every day or every time an inmate uses those areas, we start to nip it in the bud instead of waiting however long. And all of a sudden, it's, it's too late. It's all across the compound. Um, and again, Russ, a lot of these uh, inmate manufactured weapons probably could have been prevented if we did our integrity checks. Would you agree? Oh, yeah, absolutely. You know, there's there's different layers to what we're doing. Um, you know, you have to make sure, you know, we used to have, you know, the bar checks with axe handles. Um, in some of the areas that I used to work originally when I started at San Quentin. So all of those things to make sure that things aren't missing, to make sure that uh, people aren't cutting through security barriers, uh, to make sure that, um, you know, we're doing our checks with regards to our shadow boards and, uh, you know, accounting on inventories for, you know, other tools and other pieces of equipment. It's um, it just makes it that much easier to not have to go refine that stuff after they take it. Because sometimes once it's gone and you know it's gone, you look for it, but you don't necessarily ever find it again. And those are what nightmares are made of for guys like me that spent so much time inside those, you know, fences and walls. And guys, uh, shadow boards are great too, because that kind of gives you an instant visual. And you know right off the bat, like, oh, something's missing. And then you can get right on it. Because that's the key with this, guys. The key is how fast can I get on it? You know, so again, if you're doing your integrity checks and you know something's missing, well, if you did the one before and it wasn't missing and now it's missing now, you kind of know, okay, well, what inmates were in there just now? These group of inmates. Okay, guys, let's get in. Let's do some searches. Because at that point, uh, like Russ said, you, you got to stop it from being spread around. That's the key. So the faster you can get to it, the faster you can pinpoint when it happens, the faster you kind of know where it possibly could be. I think that's the biggest thing too, guys, is when you do your integrity checks, just make sure you're doing them after each and every use. Don't just wait till like the end of the day or the end of the week and all of a sudden, oh yeah, there's pieces missing. And it's like, well, I don't know how long they've been missing for. When was the last time you did an integrity check? And, and when you do those integrity checks, guys, they should be logged and you should commit to 100% effort because we're trusting you to let us know, was it there when you went there? Okay, it was, so it's not there now. That's fine. These last inmates that were in the, the wreck at that point were these group of inmates. So therefore, 
let's go check out these group of inmates because if they said they were taking a piece of the fence. Well, we know it can only be these group of inmates because you checked before and you noticed that there wasn't anything missing. Um, all right, so let's get this going, Russ. Are you ready, Russ? I'm absolutely 100% ready, Anthony. You're going to share some stories? Uh, I'm going to I'm gonna go all out on this one and kind of let loose. I'm normally kind of a little bit stayed on, you know, telling war stories and incidents that involved myself. But uh, I'm going to try and make an exception this go around. Um, bear with me, guys. I want to answer a question that's coming up in the feed. Uh, hey, Russ, can you explain what an integrity check is? You're muted, by the way. I muted you. Um, could you explain what an integrity check is so people understand? Okay, I, I will unmute. Okay, so um, integrity check just means that we're looking at the features that surround uh, the perimeter that we're trying to establish, which is our security perimeter. Um, we want to make sure that things have not been uh, jimmied with, uh, you know, things like locks, things like doors, things like bars. Um, I've seen. Um, I've seen inmates, you know, cut through bars uh, using some, you know, uh, rigged and uh, and homemade, uh, you know, even like hacksaw blades, not store bought hacksaw blades, but blades that they made um, out of things like uh, like binder clips and stuff like that, which is a hardened metal. I've seen them, you know, try and uh, saw through. I've never seen it successfully done. Saw through with things like uh, gritty toothpaste and um, and uh, dental floss. Um, we just used to take things like uh, axe handles and bang on those bars and just try and, you know, find out if there was, you know, any of different sound to them. Uh, sometimes I've seen where they would start, you know, cutting them and then fill it up with soap so that you couldn't see because, you know, the bars are dirty. They're not pristine. They're not painted all the time or anything like that. And so uh, those are the things that we want to make sure. This is why we check our locks every day. We check our doors every day. We check the fence line every day. Um, we, we check everything, you know, that could possibly be messed with as far as uh, the integrity of our perimeter. The last adult prison that I was at, we had a, um, I used to, my, I, I got in trouble for calling it the death barrier, but that's what it was. It was an electrified perimeter that if you touched it, it would kill you. And so uh, we used to have to check that. I used to have to check that um, every day as a sergeant to go around it and make sure that, you know, it looked like it was good. We had sensors to make sure that uh, the integrity of it was kept. Um, I personally one time saw a squirrel touch it and uh, it, it burned. It, it, he actually caught on fire because of it. So and lots and lots of bird deaths and things like that. So um, every single day, uh, we do integrity checks on everything between the prisoners and the outside world. And that's our security perimeter. And that's what an integrity check is. Yeah, guys, and be mindful, guys. If you're, not, if you're an officer and you're not doing those integrity checks, inmates are watching you. So the moment you miss over something is the moment where they say, okay, there's a weakness here. I can take something there. I can, you know, create something. I can, you know, be a little bit more innovative. Um, okay, guys. So when we when we do the stories, you're actually going to see pictures of the weapons that Russ have found, and then he's going to go ahead and explain how they were made and share the story behind it. So let's go back. Let me get back to where we were. Uh, let, me uh, let me push, push this back, back a little bit, bit. And, and let me bring, bring in the first one. one. Okay, okay, Russ, here, here it is. All right, so this this is a great one, and it, it actually has a really fun story behind it because I know most people that I've showed this to, they look at it for a second, and they say, "Oh, yeah, that's a that's an inmate manufactured tattoo gun." No, it's not. This is something much more interesting. I had this particular inmate who was very good at fixing things, and this was his hustle actually, and he actually made a soldering gun with a rheostat in it so he could, you know, up and down the uh, amount of heat on it. And what he would do is he would fix people's radios and TVs and other electron electronic gizmos that they can have in, in prisons, especially on some yards. And so he was just really great at it. If you look there on the left, those are a set of really teeny tiny screwdrivers that he had made. And I could see burn marks on them. So I knew that he had smuggled them out of industries because it was obvious that he put them on a grinding wheel. And there's other things that we don't want inmates putting on grinding wheels, right? 
Um, the fact that he was able to get them out and they were pretty small, um, maybe that meant that nothing big came out of there, but we could never really be sure after that. But this same guy, uh, one thing that he did was is uh, they sold these hot pots uh, in canteen and uh, he had got a bunch of the hot pots together and we used to have these uh, cookie sheet cookie sheet beds, you know, bunk beds. And he took and he attached these to the bottom of this bed and it got all the paint scraped off real nice. And um, what they would do at nighttime and in the morning is they would cook flapjacks on there. They would cook sandwiches. They would cook uh, eggs that they'd smuggled out of uh, culinary and all kinds of things. And so this is the kind of guy, although all of this stuff is kind of, you know, fun to talk about. Uh, you don't ever know what else he might be doing, what kinds of things he might be making for people, uh, what kinds of nefarious activities that he could be up to that could negatively impact the safety and security. But this was a, a good find. I managed to take uh, this particular uh, soldering uh, gun of his off, as well as all of his little tools, took his little hustle away. You know, sorry for him, but that's the way it is. You can't allow them to conduct this kind of business with these kinds of items. It's just not safe. Now, now, Russ, when you find an item like this that has so many different components, um, do you wind up after finding it like, okay, now we have to search these areas because this is where they could have got the stuff from? <clears throat> Sometimes you can have an inkling as to where it came from. Sometimes these are things that have maybe been floating around and passed on from inmate to inmate or an inmate finds where another inmate hit it years ago. Um, so it's really kind of hard to tell. I do like to try and figure out where it did come from. The, um, and on the Rio stat that he used to turn the uh, electrical uh, voltage up and down on that, I was able to determine that that came from his own personal uh, fan that he had because that fan had been disassembled. Uh, some of the other things, I suspect that they had come out of, we have a, had a vocations area where they did some repair things. And so I think they came out of there. Um, there were a bunch of odds and ends wires. It was obvious that, obvious that he had smuggled some of that, um, some of the solder that he was using out from, uh, from that area of his job where they were doing the repair stuff. So, you know, it just kind of depends. You want to track as much of it down as you can. Sometimes you're limited by time. Yeah, and guys, sometimes those fans are very inexpensive. So it doesn't really cost much for the inmate to buy a fan and then rip it apart and take that engine out. So again, if it's not an expensive item, uh, definitely be checking it because trust and believe, even if it is expensive, but... Uh, more more likely, if the inmate uh, is spending, let's say, fifteen dollars on a fan, uh, I don't think they're going to have any problems when they want to make something, rip that fan apart, and grab that motor. Uh, all right, Russ, you ready? Absolutely. Got another one. Okay, I got to blow this. Up. Okay, so uh, this was uh, two uh, really good pieces that I found in the same day. So I was one short. I used to call it whenever I found three significant uh, types of contraband in one day, I call that my hat trick. So I was one point short on this, but I did manage to get these two weapons off the yard. The bottom one there, um, I don't know exactly where it came from, but I definitely identified it as having come from one of those uh, folder files that you put in desks because I found some of those actually in some of the um, outlying secretary offices how it made its way into that particular, um, you know, secure area, secure perimeter, not sure, but definitely knew that it came from there. Uh, the other one was more a piece of a wire that I think came off of a pan inside or a wire whisk possibly um, inside uh, culinary. And they really hadn't done much with it yet. They had just started trying to tie a shoestring around it in order to give it a grip. I think that they were going to go back and work it some more. Uh, the tip probably needed a little bit more sharpening, uh, but I was, I was really proud that I pulled that one out because that one came at the very end of the day after a lot of frustration and not being able to find anything. Hey, hey, Russ, I know these inmates, they got to make these weapons sharp. I mean, uh, obviously, maybe rubbing on the floor or whatnot. Is there any uh, tips for an officer to see if maybe they can discover it, why the inmate's making the weapon, anything that they can hear or see? 
Uh, yeah, you know, there's a there's a couple things. Of course, if you hear if you hear a rhythmic scraping, you know, but a lot of times there's a lot of background noise. Uh, I'll never forget one time though um, at San Quentin, uh, one of the lieutenants called a couple of the other officers into his office, which was actually a cell, and uh, just told them to be quiet for a minute. And everyone in there could hear a rhythmic scraping. And after accessing the back area. Uh, was able to determine that two inmates in the cell directly above him were uh, making shanks. The bad thing is those guys were porters for death row. They weren't actually on the road. They were actually lower level inmates. So that's one way to look. Um, you know, also anytime, anytime that there's uh, any kind of ground like cement or potentially asphalt or asphalt mixed with um, cement, that kind of thing. Uh, it's a good area where they can take and they can sharpen things. Sometimes, you know, uh, we used to have huge yards and so they would be full of grass and stuff like that. Well, sometimes, you know, even though they're kind of deep, those rocks will work themselves to the top. And so sometimes they would manage to find some soil or some rocks that they could use. Also in some of the industries areas, um, this was a real problem is, is that they were able to smuggle back like some emery paper and things like that. Uh, in, in one case, we actually found um, one of those uh, abrasive wheels. Uh, don't know how they got that past the metal detector, but it was a big concern because that made it easy for them to sharpen something. And, you know, all they really have to do with something like that is attach it to one of those fan motors like we talked about before, and they have an actual cutting wheel. Well, what can you do with a cutting wheel? Well, yeah, you can sharpen weapons. You can also cut through security barriers and all kinds of stuff. So it's it's a big deal identifying these things because it's not just about the ability to stab someone. It can be much, much more nefarious and serious. You know, this one actually looks like a poking weapon. I mean, obviously, you also have weapons that are meant to cut you open. Uh, I mean, Russ, would there be a difference between a shank and a shiv? Uh, you know, just kind of that's kind of just a colloquialism. I always found that sh uh, uh, shank and shiv were kind of used uh, interchangeably by the inmate population and therefore by us, too. Uh, most of the time, anything else that was a slashing type weapon, uh, they would use it. Uh, they would call that a, a slasher. Um, or they would call it, uh, they had a specific one that we used to call a tomahawk where they would uh, break the head off of a disposable razor and bend back the little plastic ears. So you still had a little piece of plastic to hold on to, and you could still slash with it, uh, pretty good, you know? And, uh, so, you know, it, it just depended. And sometimes they would manage to, you know, um, get a hold of, uh, razor blades or things like that. And uh, they could embed them in things. They could embed them in little pieces of wood that I've seen before. I've seen them embed them in soap. Um, I've seen them embed them in plastic. Um, I've seen them actually take and, uh, you know, melt them into like a toothbrush head. And then they have, a, you know, a pretty good handle. And it's really wicked because it opens up, uh, you know, any vein, any artery that you hit. It moves uh, skin and fat and uh, potentially could, you know, even cut uh, bone depending on how hefty it was. I mean, guys, these weapons, you're looking at weapons that can poke or stab, cut, uh, blunt force trauma, like even just something as simple as a lock in a sock or even projectiles. There were inmates that have been known to make bow and arrows. So, again, I mean, no different than what you would see on the streets. Uh, you definitely find just a little bit more innovative, but the inmates will be able to make weapons that are very similar and obviously uh, cause a risk to our uh, staff safety. All right, Russ, what do you got here? Yeah, that's that's just a close up of that uh, soldering iron. You can see uh, you can see there in the middle where, uh, you know, he, he put the uh, the Rio stat in. And then it's just, you know, easy for him to take. I, I put some of the solder uh, the, next to it there, and he could just put that next to the tip of it and repair radios. All right, hold on. Let me get – I'm going to keep that. So hold on. All right, we got this one. All right, this one was good. This one, uh, the, the top one there was uh, part of a grill, I believe, inside culinary i wasn't able to actually find exactly where it came from you but it was really shiny yeah a, a, rack, a rack like they fit inside an oven you know to to, to um to uh heat and cook meat on 
funny that you say that because uh, obviously working uh, as an officer in the kitchen, we had to always count the racks. Make sure you count the metal lines. If there's one missing, you got to report that immediately. So, yeah, definitely, uh, definitely something that they have access to in the kitchen. And uh, this this other one below that there, um, what somehow, and I don't know where it came from, they had a great big carpenter's nail. And then they had taken and they had knocked all the guts out of that. You can see that it's a, a magic marker. And then they had managed to uh, stick that through. And then they had uh, just some other stuff that was actually wrapped up in a cloth that was with it that they could stuff in there to keep that nail from coming back through. Because when I found it, the nail was actually inside of it and the cap was just on it and it was hidden in the guy's locker. And so, uh, you know, at first it just felt like an ordinary pin. But then when I started, you know, looking at it, why does he have it wrapped up in this? You know, it didn't make didn't make sense to me. Got a little more curious, started shaking it around, opening it up and voila, it was pretty obvious what it was meant for. And obviously the size of the handle and the strength of what's on the other end of it matters. So like a marker, I mean, a pen would probably be a little bit weaker. A marker would be a better option, I'm assuming. Uh, probably definitely cause more damage. But would you would you agree that the the better the handle and then also, like you mentioned, the nail having, having to be sturdy uh, inside the marker so it doesn't get lost inside? Because they're, they're hoping to stab the person more than once, not stab them once and have the weapon break off, correct? Yeah. And, you know, with something like that, it's a matter of, you know, the amount of force that you can generate. As you can see, even like on the upper one, uh, you know, that's a pretty good uh, that's a pretty good uh, ball of uh, material there that'll just, you know, rest inside the, the palm of your hand and allow you to grip it. And uh, you can either traditional stabbing motion or turn it around and move that thing out, uh, you know, kind of. Uh, for lack of a better term, Wolverine style through your fingers and, uh, you know, be able to go at a guy's eyes and, and neckline with that. What, what, what is that cloth? What is that on the bottom of that? Top? That cloth is just bed sheet. They took, bed they sheet. took bed sheet and they, and they wrapped, they wrapped it around until it was that thick. And, and, uh, inside of that, there's a loop of that metal material and they tied it to that metal material. And then they just twisted it around that over and over and over again so that they would have uh, a way to generate that force while they're doing the stabbing action. So are bed sheets common for handles? I, I would say that it's probably the most common material that there is. Uh, probably next in line is sometimes if they manage to, you know, steal tape from somewhere. Um, I've seen shoestrings used a lot. It's just, uh, you know, kind of dependent on what they have. Uh, old t-shirts, uh, blankets, uh, anything that'll pad that handle and make it thick enough that they can uh, manage to get more force generation on the tip of that thing. So, so what are the officers looking for? Rip sheets, uh, rip, rip. Wow. That's tough. That, that's like, that, that was, that's two tough words to say. I didn't realize that. Are the officers looking for rip sheets or, uh, rip blankets? Uh, yeah, you can't, you can, it's, it's almost impossible to keep up with that thing based on the ratio of inmates to officers. One thing that you one thing that you can do with something like that is obviously obviously um, if you're lucky enough um, to find the weapon early on, you might luck out and find a forensic rip that matches exactly something else that they have in their possession that might be uh, that might lend itself towards some kind of constructive possession. Um, the other thing that you can do is, is if you're willing to just go in there, and this is hard to do because sometimes you don't have um, the resources to do it. If you make sure that, you know, you're beefing these guys for ripping sheets and charging them for it. And by charging, I mean replacement of the sheet, you know, and, you know, it's $2.50 or whatever. You can make it a nuisance for them to do it that way. But there's nothing really stopping them from stealing someone else's sheet. There's nothing stopping them from stealing a T-shirt. There's nothing stopping them really from using their own T-shirt that they bought, say, in commissary. So it's very hard to do. Um, there are some ways that you can use it, like I said, with regards to constructive possession and uh, forensics on something like that. 
but it's kind of uh, it's kind of too hard to just go out all the time. Yeah, guys, if you do see a pattern, uh, let's say this one inmate just constantly has those ripped sheets or whatever. Usually, people get stuck in their familiar patterns. I mean, don't get me wrong; they evolve as well. But in desperation, they may go back to what's easier for them. Uh, you know, if they have a developed pattern, then we just have to be heavy with our searches on them. You know, if this is someone that has a habit of making weapons, then, you know, we should be searching them a little bit more often than we would the rest of the general population or <coughs> whatever population you're dealing with. All right. This is a unique one. This is a syringe, which is still a weapon in my eyes. Yeah. So um, one thing that we tended to look at a lot was is uh, is our diabetic population. Uh, so uh, them being diabetic doesn't mean that they're going to be kind to their body and stop using things. It also doesn't mean that they're not going to have a hustle and try and rent out rigs. So what tends to happen in order to make these rigs harder to find is once they smuggle that uh, needle out of uh, medical. And one way that they'll do that is, is uh, they'll pretend to drop it in the sharps container and drop something else like a like a pen. And if the nurse isn't watching, if the officer isn't watching, they hear it. They assume that the inmate dropped it. If they're not being searched well on the way out, uh, maybe the inmate has an opportunity to actually get the cap on and hoop that. But once it makes it out there to the yard, they're not going to risk it being found. So what they generally do is they cut it down. They cut the plunger. They cut the barrel. Um, sometimes they reattach that needle to a much um, smaller piece of rubber tubing or something like that that they can hide and be sure that they're going to have use to it. And the way that they have used to it also, it, it involves, you know, what's their drug of choice, but it also depends on whether or not they're actually using or they're going to rent it out because uh, people that are out there hitting drugs, if they don't have a way to deliver that system, they still have to have um, a way to rent something out, pay somebody for it. These are all common hustles that they do all the time. Um, I had uh, one situation slightly related to this one, not in the exact same place, but on another yard where um, I was I was getting on the, the officers uh, who were letting inmates into this old abandoned uh, dorm that was part of that yard. And these were the clerks and everything else. And so they were just letting these guys go in there and use the shower, use the facility. I said, you can't do that. They're going to be back here doing wrong stuff. So I, I got him out of there and went back in there the first day I was there as a sergeant and sure enough, found a syringe right there, went back, you know, found obvious, you know, a video of these guys sticking their arm through the window. And so they were paying for the use of the rig and for the dope at the exact same time. Well, I will tell you guys something right now. Obviously you should be keeping sharp counts. Uh, it should be. Your supervisor may be complimented with somebody from medical. You know, you kind of partner together uh, because it's an inventory that both parties are responsible for. Ultimately, medical has their level of responsibility over that, but then custody oversees that level of responsibility. So I believe the sharp count should be done. Uh, ultimately, a final count should be done by some supervisor. You could have your front line as well, but I would prefer the supervisor just to have that secondary level. Uh, and also, guys, if you found something like that and let's say administration you know gets a wind of it they gotta have medical at the table on this one you know we gotta be sitting together and discussing like hey guys look what just happened look what we just found because i don't think in some cases there may be some people from medical that may not know how serious this is so to bring them to the table and just kind of show them the ingenuity behind an inmate that is jonesing for a drug or has the ability to sell stuff uh and I will tell you another thing. That's why for the inmates that work the hospital porters, you don't want them to have any type of drug charge in their history, whatever brought them in. You don't want them to have any drug charges if they're, you want no charges while they're in the prison because I'm not going to say it's 100% because nothing's 100%, but that's one of the markers that you look for. It says, nope, I don't care if you had a drug charge that was dismissed. You are not working the infirmary. Now, I'm not saying that it can't be other ones, but having said that, I just think that's a an obvious marker. And when you're reviewing for those job placements uh, for infirmary, one of the things you don't want in the infirmary uh, next to us, well, next to a sex offender as well, is you don't want somebody who has a 
drug history. Uh, would you agree with that, Russ? At some point, right? Yeah, but that's that that is going to be hard, though. Um, yeah. You might want you might have to cut it back to that they don't have a history of it inside, you know, any prison or jail facility. But uh, you know, all these guys, like, almost all to a one, are going to have some kind of drug charge on them. So it does it makes it really difficult to, it's to difficult, try and to but where where it is difficult, guys. Russ is one hundred percent, you know. Um, accurate with that, but it is doable because we do do it. Um, but having said that, it's it makes it hard uh, because even if you're lucky, because Russ does make a very good point here, even if you're lucky and find somebody, these porters should be rotated out every six months uh, to limit uh, eliminate undue familiarity. So again, you're right, pickings could be slim already, and now you're looking to rotate them out. So having said that, it's like when this guy's ready to go, it's like, well, the only person I can swap them with is someone that may have had a drug history in the past. It's like, okay, well now I got the drug history and I got the chance for undo. You know, what, what do I, what am, what am I going to choose? Um, all right, Russ, let's get to the next one. All right, we did that one. Hold on one second. We got this one. That's a nice one. Oh, no, yay. Okay. This one, this one was a beauty. And uh, okay. So anyway, uh, one of the things that I do, or did I should say is, is I was always I was always looking to you know find STG affiliations with um, certain people. I had this one uh, particular area that was really heavy under the influence of uh, the Sereños and more importantly the Mexican Mafia, and so I knew it was just a matter of time until something serious showed up there because I knew that this one individual in there who was uh, probably a shot caller. Um, was going to, you know, have to have some heavy duty items in there uh, if for nothing else for whatever dope that they might be moving or anything else on the yard. So I kind of uh, scouted out the area for several days. Uh, it was maybe even a week or two. And I was just, you know, watching for differences in uh, the way they conduct themselves, differences in their behavior. Most importantly, though, is I was uh, staying away from certain areas that I used to search all the time because I thought that I could get them to fall into my lap. And um, I didn't have any way of controlling it, what other staff were doing, but I knew that they would be watching me. And so I made a good show of it, not searching a couple of areas that I thought were really good hiding areas. And so after about two weeks of this, I went back in and uh opened up this uh vent that was really tight and really hard to open and i'd opened it before but like i say it had been a while and sure enough that's what i found inside i had been looking everywhere else and so it was, it was just kind of a trap and a setup on my part because i had that reputation for finding stuff and so they were nervous about having it in this particular uh area that they were in and so I kind of lulled them into a false sense of security. And by doing that, I was able to get them to buy into the fact that, hey, look, he's, he's not searching these areas. He's looking really slack these days. I don't know what exactly may have went through their head, but that was the sense I was trying to convey to them. So I was really proud. I mean, I was damn proud of getting that weapon out of there because that wasn't just about searching or technique or reading body language. That was an actual psychological operation that uh, came up pretty good for me, I thought. Yeah, and that's a serious weapon right there. That, that's going to hurt you going in, hurt you coming out. And it uh, looks like it's uh, light, so you're not just going to hit one time with that. You're looking at getting stabbed up 20, 30 times with that weapon. And again, that weapon's meant to you know, <laughs> definitely get you on the way out as well. You're mute. I want to show you guys a shadow board. It came up in the uh, in the uh, discussion, uh, and then I'll have Russ explain it. It was a great question by Alicia, and I believe someone else popped it in. Uh, I just want to mention something, guys. Shadow boards are essential, essential, E-S-S, -S, essential, because it gives you quick notification of which tool is missing. So let me just – I found one. So let me just go ahead, and I'll have Russ kind of break it down. Um there's a few of them here. So let me just, uh, the shadow boy was made. All right, so I'll use, I'll use this one. All right, guys, I'm going to share something with you real quick. 
and then Russ can maybe explain it, if you don't mind, Russ. No, not at all. All right, so I'm, I'm going to use this one, Russ. Do you see it, Russ? Yeah, I can see it. So, yeah, if, if you guys look at this, and I know it, it might look kind of small on your screen. It, it, it's small on mine. But um, basically what they have there is there's a bunch of racks that you um, insert tools into, right? And each one of those places where that tool is inserted into has uh, has a different background on it so that you can readily identify what the tool is, even if it's not there. And so by, by um, enabling yourself to do that and just look at this board real quick, you can see by the difference in the colors, you see there's a black background. And then uh, wherever there's a tool, there's a yellow background. That's exactly what you look for. So you know everything that's been checked out. Now you take that shadow board, right? And you contrast that against uh, what your inventory list is. And then you know who checked that particular item out. Now, depending on how different uh, institutions do things, we used to have a chit system. So you have uh, a brass chit with your name engraved on it and or stamped into it and you put it up there and you want the six inch screwdriver all right so you'd be able to uh, check that out and then uh, they can see right away hey uh, officer hamilton checked that particular screwdriver out his chit is here it's all good to go we can see exactly what's going on there uh, also it has to be written in, in that log book but this way if you want to see exactly what's going on and be able to account for everything quickly, this is the way to do it without having to look through all the paperwork and check things off. This gives you an instantaneous knowledge of exactly what's missing and exactly what's present. All right. So now let me just get myself back. All right, guys, I'm going to go back to the video again. But again, guys, if you feel <laughs> the questions are, put them in there. And if I have to slow down the video and, you know, kind of explain we're willing to do that. I think that was a great uh, question by the audience here. You know, again, sometimes we use the jargon without realizing that others may not know it. So keep it coming. I have no problem stopping and letting you guys know what that means. But I will say this. If your facility is not using a shadow board, use them. Uh, I mean, literally, you should be using them at this point. I mean, that's pretty much a, a lifelong tool. Uh, we, I, I couldn't imagine not having one in our tool cribs. Okay, guys, so bear with me. Let me... Uh, let me get back to that video. And here we go. Um, again, again, guys, these are just some of the dangerous weapons, weapons that inmates can make. make. And again, is that wrapped with sheet? That one is wrapped with sheet or t-shirt. I'm not, I'm not sure which. All right. And what was that made of again, Russ? That was made out of steel. And that steel came out of uh, part of a, a locker that I found that they busted out the back of it, and uh, you couldn't see it. You had to pull it out. You had to pull it out away from the from the wall that it was that it was on to see that that was missing. But it was. Uh, I mean, like I say, that one's one that I'm I'm super proud of because to work that angle and uh, figure out that those guys were you know top of the food chain at least for that yard and so forth and to get them to fight into that thing that I'm slipping and they can and they can hide a weapon in there and I'm not going to find it yeah i caught them slipping all right i got oh this is a okay uh, this is this is uh, one of my this is one of my favorite um ones uh because of where we found it this was this was me and a partner actually actually found this now you see the upper one there that is a big, heavy-duty piece of plastic that they beveled down. But the way that they cut it out was is they took uh, they took dental floss and they ran it down the side of this big, thick uh, coffee cup. So it's one of those big, thick plastic ones that they had in all the chow halls. And they kind of cut it into its shape, and then they beveled it on its side, and then they wrapped it with cloth, right? And then the second thing down is a piece of brazing iron that one of the the one of the maintenance crews either brought in and dropped or something like that and the other one is an intact uh syringe i would almost never find them like this this syringe was almost perfectly intact it looked like they had bent it a little bit uh, maybe trying to work with it and get ready to cut it down but that wasn't all that was in there right there were cell phones and chargers and all kinds of stuff that's just 
that's just uh, three of the things that came from that allowed me to call it in my in my own mind. What I said, you know, is the is is the hat trick because I had two weapons. There's actually a third weapon in there, not pictured, and the syringe. But the thing about this one, it was is me and my partner. This is one of the few ones that um, I actually got only due to an inmate snitch, and he said that there was a vault in this area. But he wasn't specific, right? He just said there was a vault in that area. And so me and my partner, we went back and we looked and we left and we came back and we looked around some more. And I said, man, I don't see I don't see where it could possibly be. And so we started looking closer and closer and closer. And we were looking at these tiles in the shower area. Right. And uh, he looks up and he says, so is that grout in there or is that toothpaste? And so I got like a little, I got a little tool of mine that had a little paper clip on it. And I started scratching on at it and it was really, really soft. And I was going, that's not grout. It could be toothpaste. It could be tooth powder. Not really sure. And so I just, you know, went all around it and stuff. And sure enough, the grout just came out. It was really easy. I didn't have to go back and forth or anything. And so then we're just looking at a tile, right? And so I grabbed a hold of that thing and I pulled and pulled and I, could, I couldn't get it to move at all. You know, and so my partner's looking at me and I'm looking at him and he's like, well, what do you think? And so I said, well, I guess I'm either going to get in trouble or I'm not. And so I, uh, I deployed my, uh, Manadnock expandable baton and I broke the tile out. Guess I lucked out because that's what was behind it. And it was in a huge, I mean, it was a huge cavern. I mean, I could reach my arm all the way back in there. How they were getting that tile in and out of there, I still was never able to figure out. But I figured out that, hey, you know, that grout, it's really it's really soft. So I'm just going to break that tile out, and it worked out good for me. What about, I just sharing that story, what about if it was, like, there for a while, and then maybe something happened and maintenance fixed it, and then maybe the inmate was an old-time inmate who said, hey, you know what, a long time ago, whatever, this stuff was up there, and the maintenance, you know, you know, redid the tiling or did something and then it just wind up being there. I, I don't I don't think that it was there for very long because one of the uh, tell one of the phones inside there had a charge on it. Oh, that's right. You said you said you found. Yeah. That. So and there and and at that and at that time um, in this particular area there, we weren't getting too many phones yet. It was f phones were few and far between. As a matter of fact, those might have only been like the, you know, very early on in the whole phone saga, maybe the 10th or 15th phone that we ever found. Oh, man. And now, hey, hey, Russ, so the top one, that's made from the plastic cup, you said, correct? So that's yes. going to be undetectable. Um, do you find that the plastic weapons are more dangerous than the metal, metal more dangerous than the plastic? Or obviously, they're both dangerous, but if you well, make going if an inmate I, I was going to choose think, between, a, well, I was going to say, if an inmate had to choose to be effective, and they wanted to choose between a plastic or a metal weapon, are they going for the metal? Metal, metal all the way. Um, I, I would say because because metal it um the can go much thinner, and it means that you can get a puncture on an organ that counts, such as the heart, the pericardial sac, the lungs, um, the liver, uh, and the kidneys, which are all deadly shots. Right. Um, plastic um, is just kind of one of those things. Yes, you can defeat the metal detector with it. Um, yes, it's easier to get a hold of. Um, I've seen I mean, I've seen damage done with uh, plastic shanks, but by and large, it's it's the metal that you want. Like if you look at that little piece of brazing rod there, I know it's hard to see, but they had actually started sharpening it. And even though it looks small and like it couldn't do too much. It could, you know, you could uh, damage that pericardial sac and cause it to fill with blood and kill someone in pretty short order. Now, might it glance off of a rib because it's not that sturdy? Yeah, it could. Um, you know, you could put it in somebody's kidney, uh, probably uh, cause them to lose that kidney, maybe get an infection, maybe die. Um, you know, but uh, metal that's just a little bit stouter than that, uh, goes a long ways towards, uh, you know, being a better weapon overall. Yeah, wow. All right, now, Russ, uh, we got this. Okay, so 
this was uh, one of my hat tricks, right? Uh, the one on top there was very similar to the other weapon. They had cut okay. that out of the side of the cut uh, using that dental floss technique that I talk about. It just, um, you know, they go so fast that it just it melts that uh, plastic out of the way and just leaves like a little bit behind and then they can just break it out. And then that's wrapped again with sheet or some kind of uh, t-shirt material. So that was all good. Um, the one below that, that was part of a broom handle. And what happened was, is they had, they had actually cut part way through it and then just, they, they take and they break it over their knee and it causes it to just get into that. Now they did, hadn't worked on it much. Um, they were going to work on it more. Um, all of these came out of a ceiling, um, that was made to look like it was still in place and still intact. And so, um, I managed to pull that out of there, the bottom one there, um, they took that from a, we used to have a bunch of, uh, bed springs in this area until we replaced them all with the cookie sheets. And, uh, that piece of metal is, uh, wrapped with uh, the sheets or t-shirt material again, and then bound on the outside of that with shoestring. It looks a little twisty or whatever, which would probably, you know, slow it down going through you. But you know what? If that's hitting your face or your neck, it's uh, it could still ruin your day and possibly ruin your life. So um, all of these, um, taking them um, out in one fell swoop from one place, um, and doing all of that. Uh, by the way, based on body language that these inmates were given off in the in the area where I found this, uh, you know, I felt like it was uh, I felt like it was a good day. Yeah, guys, broomsticks, mops, those are obviously controlled items. If by any chance, uh, you know, you're missing one, you need to report that immediately. Uh, and that should be something that you should be able to find pretty quick because when you lend out a controlled item, I'm assuming you're taking the inmate's ID. You're not allowing them to pass it around and you're holding that inmate responsible for that controlled item. And then if, let's say, you have a broom that breaks, that becomes controlled trash. You know, you call your supervisor or call somebody immediately to get that out of the unit. That does not go to a porter to throw out. That goes directly through custody's hand and nobody else's. That means that literally goes from custody's hand all the way outside of the control compound and into the trash to be picked up immediately. If Again, it's, it's not trash that a porter should ever get their hands on. That is controlled trash. Uh, would you agree with that, Russ? Yeah, we used to we used to call that hot trash, and it could consist of lots of things. I mean, it could be uh, it could be like old uh, old little motors that they were using for their tattoos. It could be those broom handles like that. Uh, a lot of times, you know, we regardless of how hard we tried to hit it, we would find um, old uh, you know porn or something like that. And you didn't want to just you know, hey, you guys wheel this big cart of uh, crap away. You know, no, you got to take the hot trash out and put it in a specific area and uh, make sure that it makes it outside the institution. Otherwise, they have the potential to do things like this, you know, uh, make more weapons. Uh, and, you know, it can be even something that would like help them. Like uh, it used to drive me nuts that on some of our lower yards, they would have dental floss. And I'm just like, come on, man, they're, they're, they're taking the dental floss and they're cutting they're cutting uh, plastic with it. Um, in order to make weapons. And you never know, you know, how, how that's going to go for you. Yeah, and obviously cutting plastic with dental floss takes some time, guys. So that's how patient these inmates are. Because you're, you're, well, I mean, you know what? It, it, it can, but you'd be, you'd be amazed at how quick that they can get it to go. We had uh, a really large incident. Um, I would say we probably had 150 inmates on our yard, all in either handcuffs or in plastic shackles and uh we watched one of the guys uh roll over to another guy's feet get uh get his shoelace off and cut through his and cut through the the plastic uh, uh ziploc ties in probably under about 20 seconds so yeah. you, you never you never know it's 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 surprising these guys they they practice stuff and you know they get practiced at it and so you'd be surprised how quick they can actually make something like that go. Yeah, some of these inmates are allowed even to have plastic chairs 
in their cell, which I believe is a no-no because they can cut a piece of the plastic off by using uh, dental floss or even a shoelace and get a nice little um, nifty yeah, or they can, out of that. Or they can, uh, sometimes on some of those things, while we got rid of some of our plastic chairs, is I showed them, you know, you make a scoring mark and then you take and you break it, right? And then it's the right shape and then you take and you trace it onto the, the next uh, part of the chair leg and you break that one and then you bind them together and they're doubly strong. You know, it's the, it's the same, it's the same way as if you've ever seen them make it out of um, Lexan or plexiglass, you know, all they have to yeah. do is score it and break it and score it and break it and they can make it as thick as they want. And then they can work on it and sharpen it from all angles and actually make a cylindrical one, which is a really nasty thing to encounter. <laughs> There's Russ history in the CBCR. Hey Russ, what about this one? This is one of my favorites, man, because uh, once again, I'm, I'm I'm working hard that day for for a hat trick. And, uh, you know, I'll, I'll never forget, man. I, I worked real hard and I finally got those two pieces and I got them out. I got them out of uh, an, an area right next to where I got the cell phone from. But anyway, I had managed to get those and I was pretty tired and tuckered. But because I had two. I had to go for more because I'm greedy like that, right? And so uh, the next area that I was in was a common area shower. And uh, I walked in there and there was an inmate. And I said, what's up? And right then, you know, he got that deer in the headlights look. And I don't know if it's because I was an officer or maybe, you know, I'd had some prior dealings with him on some things. And sometimes they start to react to who you are instead of what you are, because you've taken a whole lot of uh, dope and uh, everything else from him, and he froze and he completely lost it. And so I immediately, I put him in handcuffs, patted him down real good, didn't find anything. I figured anything that he had had to be within five feet of him. So I limited myself to five feet. And the first thing I did was, is I looked up and there was just like a, there was like, just like a little exhaust vent. I could see it didn't messed with a little bit. And I opened that up and inside was that cell phone. And so that gave me my hat trick for the day. And then I was happy and I could go home. That's a successful day for Russ Hamilton. Guys. It was a successful day for me. If I get that hat trick, it was a successful day. All right. Now we got this, this is from the filing cabinet, right, Russ? Yes. And that is made of aluminum. And uh, this one, uh, this one scared me pretty severely because what happened was, is in this particular um, housing unit, they had like these uh, 36 man dorms and there was probably, I'm going to say somewhere between nine and 11 guys um, in the dorm that I recovered this from. And what happened was, is I would just like, you know, go in and walk through and walk out and, you know, not even necessarily search or anything like that, but I'm just checking on the temperature of things as I like to call it, right? And I walked in and I walked through and I stopped for a second because I felt it, you know, it's those little hairs on my neck and these guys, they're just like, you know, looking at me and I'm looking at them and no one's saying anything. And so I immediately keyed the door and got out of there and called for backup. And um, from outside the door where I was where I was safe, I was, uh, you know, yelling at those guys to, to stay down or whatever. And so we came in and we started conducting um, cuffing operations immediately and started pulling them out. And I got back in there where three of the guys were um, underneath uh, this vent. Of course, I couldn't put it on them, but um, I got up into this vent and I looked and this was diagonally in the vent. It should have been laying flat. It should have been up underneath the crease where no one could see it, but they got in a hurry. They got sloppy because I startled them and I was probably lucky to get out of there the way I did with uh, no puncture wounds, uh, you know, no hits or anything like that. But I knew immediately that uh, they had a significant piece in there. So uh, yeah, on, on that one, um, like I say, I was probably uh, lucky to make it out of there without any puncture wounds and without uh, getting hit. Uh, these guys were probably pretty serious about it, but they kind of gave away the game, so to speak, in a way that I was able to get out of there in time, get some reinforcements back, 
and put myself in a position to recover that. And as you can see, that's a that's a really sturdy piece. It's 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 long, it's pointed. They'd worked on it obviously for some time. Um, curiously enough, um, made completely out of aluminum, so it was really really lightweight. And uh, one of my one of my favorite uh, uh, late career pieces, as it were. Not my best ever, but definitely one of the best that I've ever been able to take a picture of. Because um, the, all the pictures I have of my stuff are all of my, my last two years because the advent of uh, cameras hadn't yet been invented when I first started. Yeah, guys, like this this is one of the things where we're very big on checking this as well. Uh, we check office areas, education, libraries, um, the uh, chaplaincy area, whatever it is that has file cabinets, and you make sure you check to see if those um, file cabinets have, it's the, I mean, it's the rack, technically, correct, Russ? It's what puts the folders or yeah the, the folders the folders sit on, sit on top of them yeah so yeah you always got to make sure they're there because they do go missing no different than the food service racks uh this tends to go missing as well you'll find that inmates uh do make a lot of weapons uh utilizing that so that's a very good find uh all right russ we got this one okay um okay through through some of these you're going to start to see uh, a little bit of a pattern develop in that uh, the amount of aluminum that I was taking off of yards on on any given day was really high and it was it was really distressing. Um, I don't know if you can see on the opposite side of this one, they had actually uh, taped a little bit of metal and on the other side of it, they put a magnet so that the magnet would hold it because it was still all of that's aluminum, right? So um, they fastened a little bit of metal to it so they could use magnets on it to hide this one up out of the way. Uh, this one, I believe, was uh, hit up in a um, up underneath a sink in a in a bathroom area. And uh, I took it out of there, I think, like right after they put it up. Um, once again, this was this was one of those uh, situations where just watching that, you know, people were acting like they had weapons in the area, uh, trying to move in on them, trying to see what we could do as far as pat downs, trying to see if we could locate things in an area. And sure enough, in this one, we came up. Um, this one uh, also ended up, we had about 15 to 20 drunk individuals in that area. And we had to take the area back by, uh, by uh, bringing in a team with some uh, 40 millimeter firepower and uh, you know using a little bit of chemical agents uh, you know start cuffing operations uh, you know a couple of the guys plexed up we had to take them down uh, very very dicey stuff especially knowing that i just recovered this from an area and these guys could definitely be holding more and, and russ uh same thing file cabinet on this one, I'm not sure because it was, as you can see, it's like really wide. And so I was never able to determine exactly where it came from. Um, like I say, it was it was just weird that I was having so much um, aluminum on, uh, on the yard at this time. And so uh, some of this stuff, definitely from the from the file cabinet, uh, you know, a desk drawer uh, holder kind of thing. But this one was was way thicker than that, and I was never able to actually establish uh, an origin for it. And do you, uh, the handle, though, what's that? Do you know? Uh, that handle right there is um, all shoelaces. All shoelaces. That's unique. All right, Russ, what about this one? Oh, let me scoot in on this one for a little. Oh, I don't, oh, this this doesn't allow me to do that. My my phone does, which I was on. Uh, this one, gosh, see, you, you see the pattern I'm talking about now, right? Yeah. And that all of these are are aluminum. So uh, this, can you read what that one says? Because I found a whole bunch that were kind of the same. Yeah, if you give me a second. Uh, so wait, this one is, uh, well, what's the, is that probably still bed sheets? Uh, that is actually, on this one, as I recall, that was actually tape. It was some kind of white tape that they had found. All right, so I'm, I I'm having I'm right having a little now. bit of a hard time seeing it here because I'm on my yeah. It I'm says my... dorm dorm forty four plumbing chase. Okay, I I remember I remember this one now. This one 
<laughs> this one they had they had uh, taken and they had taped a piece of uh, a metal to it, and then it had magnets on the back of it, and then it was sitting in there just like inside the chase where you couldn't see it. And I don't even know how they got it in there for sure. Uh, because it was it was really tricky. I opened I opened the chase by opening the lock because I had I had access to those keys on that day, and I was actually I was actually surprised that I found something like that. It made me think that someone in there either had fashioned a key or knew enough about picking locks that they could get into that. And I actually came back to that plumbing chase a few weeks later and found even more. Uh, significant uh, contraband in it, um, including including more shanks. But this one was kind of unique in that if you see uh, how it sharpened to a point there, the point was not only sharpened, but it was also beveled on all the edges. Bevel-sided dagger type along with the beveling. So because of the beveling, it could also uh, slash or cut. So this one, even though it's not very long or anything like that, a very, very dangerous piece. Yeah, and guys, this is going to be the last one. All right, Russ. Okay. So uh, the, two, the two metal pieces um, on the right there, that's what we would call weapon stock. Um, it doesn't look like much, but they could potentially fashion that into something. That came off of an electrical ring inside a cement wall. And uh, what had happened was, is they had just, I don't know if they had found it and it had been covered up by cement or what, because I was never able to establish exactly where it came from, but it's obviously that they worked on it until it broke. So I couldn't find exactly where it came from, but I knew that that was gonna be used in the future because all of these things were also wrapped up inside a sock and made it nice and easy for me. But the other thing that you see there is another plastic shank. And that shank um, was a little bit different because it came from a mop bucket. So we give these guys stuff to clean, right? And we account for the stuff every day. But you know what? There's like some areas on these buckets and stuff where if you're not looking real close, they can clip things away. And what they had done, and I, I talked about this a lot, right? It was the old uh, dental floss trick again. They managed to, you know, get a hole in it or start from one edge and they just, you know, friction, friction, friction. It melts that and uh, that dental floss is really, really strong, guys. And then uh, they just, you know, shape it to what they want. Later on, they can come back. They could have added a handle. Uh, they could have beveled it a little bit. Um, typically on one like that, that's that thick. Uh, a lot of times they'll split it in two and make two shanks you know, and get a uh, different handle material for it. So there's a lot of different things that, that they can do for that. And at that particular time, it was down on um, an end of one yard where we were having a lot of gang activity and a lot of problems between, uh, between the uh, blacks and the, and the Southsiders. And again, guys, a mop bucket being a controlled item. Hey, Russ, let me get, let me get both your eyes. I see one eye there. Move back oh, a little bit. We zoomed oh, in. Nope, the other there we yeah. go. All right. all right, guys. So all right, guys. So there was a lot there to cover. Me and Russ did that episode uh, maybe a few months back. Hey, there was a couple of questions here I want to hit up in the chat real quick. Uh, so when inmates do hide contraband inside their body, so basically when you do this strip frisk, you're going to have the inmate uh, bend over at their waist. If it's a male inmate, uh, women uh, may have to squat and cough. Uh, but when you have the male bend over at their waist and you have them spread their cheeks, if you see something there, you cannot remove it. You know, I mean, technically, even medical could have a concern removing it. So the person uh, winds up going on a contraband watch. Because think about this. If they're hiding a weapon, as you move the weapon out, it could cut them. And also, you have people, inmates that are desperate that... Um, they could swallow like plastic bags of contraband. And when you find out that they've done it, if the officer sees them put something in their mouth, even if they don't know if it's, you know, what it was, they'll put the person on a contraband watch because sometimes the bags open up inside their body. And now you have a very big concern. You have an overdose waiting to happen. But, but Russ, obviously grabbing that contraband from the inside of an individual is just not something we're going to do. 
You're muted, Russ. Uh, let me just uh, oh. unmute you, Russ. Uh, so you oh. see how, Russ, I just want to get that moment off. Let's just reflect here because everybody seems to attack me. So I just want to live that again. Did you know? In, fair, in fairness to me, my mic was unmuted. You had remote control over my mic. Maybe I did. So. But I, I would like to share the story of how I discovered you were move, uh, muted. Uh, what happened, guys, his mouth was moving, but we couldn't hear it. And when I noticed that, as the good CEO I was, being very observant, I was quick to act by saying, Russ, you're mu muted. And then Russ was quick to react by, oh, you're not muted anymore, Russ. Yeah. <laughs> he's, he's not muted, guys. He's playing games. I'm not muted. Russ okay, so... Okay, so let, so let, let's let's talk let's talk about what what's happening what's happening when you're doing a strip search here, right? Um, the first thing is, is um, you know, if they got it all the way in, you're not going to see it. Uh, but there are some things that you may see. You may see evidence that they've uh, used some kind of lubrication to help facilitate that. Um, you, th there's a possibility that they might have tried to do the old string trick where they can use a string to try and help pull it back out. Um, and you know, those are just, you know, uh, some considerations that we have to think about. If you see something like that, you instantly have to get that person in, into handcuffs because you don't want them getting their hands on something that's dangerous or something that, you know, could potentially hurt them like dope. Um, and so that's that's really, you know, the, the thing that we look for at that point. After that, we always want to try and identify exactly what's up there. Um, they're going to be taken. They're going to be um, x-rayed and we're going to see if it's dope. We're going to see. I actually used to have it. I don't have it anymore. I used to have some x-rays that showed cell phones up in there. Um, and then um, other times I've I've had x-rays, too, that showed actual weapons up there. So it just, you know, it just kind of depends on, you know, how talented they are. And, uh, you know, it, it is something that, uh, you know, nobody wants to talk about. And yet time and time again, we see that that uh, particular um, way of concealing contraband used over and over and over again. Yeah, guys, when it comes to cell search or just searches in general, we do commit to a set of random searches, obviously. So if you're working a housing unit, it could be about three or four cells, whatever it is, or bed areas if it's a dorm. Uh, if it's overnight, you're not going to wake up the inmates, so you're going to search public areas randomly. Uh, yard, well, yards we search every each use, but, you know, the rec modules, uh, you know, whatever, public areas, the kitchen areas, the libraries, the, you know, the educational, social services, wh whatever it is, you're going to search more public areas. Now, don't get me wrong, you are going to have targeted searches, too, if there's intel, uh, we're going to go ahead and act on that intel. And sometimes it's funny, guys. You have inmates that are known for bringing in contraband. They're known for having contraband. So we have to be on point with them. So we're going to do searches just to keep them on their toes. But then sometimes they'll call their lawyers saying that they're being harassed. And now what happens is we get pressure to pull back on the searches. And here's another thing, too. If you have officers that are aggressive and they're, they're going after and they're doing what they're supposed to do, all of a sudden, you get an officer that's close to finding something, and, it, and an inmate will make a complaint about that officer. Let's say something probably sexual or something. And next thing you know, that officer who has that momentum now has to be removed from that unit until the investigation is conducted. Now, with that said, when inmates start weaponizing, in this case here would be a PREA, Prison Rape Elimination Act policy, we still have to follow through by having staff that's going to replace that person while the investigation happens to be just as active because we cannot allow them to control us at that level. And the other thing, guys, is nine times out of 10, we may not find anything. Uh, you know, nine times out of 10, we just may find nooses contraband, but you should treat every search as if you're going to find something big because the moment you don't and you go there already defeated, you're not even making the effort. You know, and that's the scary thing because when you log in, that these cells have been searched or these areas have been searched, someone's going to read it and say, well, Russ did that, so I'm going to go do this. Yeah, but Russ may not have done it effectively. You know, so always when you're doing those searches and you log it in, do that search at 110%. Would you agree with that, Russ? Yeah, that's uh, that's one of the things, you know, we always try and be as, as effective as we can be. We always try and be as thorough as we can be. Um, part of the problem though is, is we live in the real world and there are 
thou- uh, well, depending on the institution you work in, there can be thousands of inmates and one or two of you. Um, you know, it's, uh, it's many times, you know, it's just, you know, how far you can get. You're doing exclusionary searches, which is kind of the fallback, least common denominator way of doing things. Yes, they are, they're important to do. But um, that's one of the things that they just kind of uh, over the years, they, they dole that out to staff and tell them, hey, you have to do X number of searches. And uh, they do that to force a search to be done. And it's just not as effective as someone who is out there not worrying about the searches they're doing, but targeting searches based on things like body language, based thing like things on um, on you know uh, mass movements of inmates, uh, doing it based on you know prior experience and things like that. So uh, you know it's um, it's a it's a talent and it's an art. And uh, a lot of times, though, the things with regards to um, good searches and stuff are just, you know, um, they're just kind of, you know, thrown as kind of a second, third rate type of thing by management because they really uh, have staff that aren't committed to the process. They have staff that just want to do the minimum possible. So if you're doing the minimum possible, um, you're not going to get good results. So that's kind of that's kind of my beef with the with the whole thing. Yeah, and guys, it's it's. Uh, I think Sierra mentioned about those small things, nuisance, nuisance contraband. Sometimes what happens is, and never fall for this. Sometimes inmates will put small things for you to discover, and then some people discover the small thing and they're happy and they stop the search. It's like, oh yes, I discovered this, and the search stopped. It's like, don't do that. They're red herrings. You know, nuisance contraband. No, you continue going. Sometimes those things are meant for a reason. And even when you have dorms, when you have open areas, sometimes you have these officers and this is to me crazy and understaffed facilities. So when you have a, when you have a dorm, you could have hundreds of inmates in an open area. And then you have officers probably in some cases by themselves that now have to search those bed areas, which means that they have to get the inmate, you know, off to the side so they can search it. And in some States, in some states, guys, now this is this is going to blow your mind. In some states, it's the inmate's right to watch the officer do the search. Now, a lot of people may think, well, I get it. It's their property. Why don't you want them to watch it? Because what happens here is if they watch it, they understand the officer's pattern. They start to see where the officer's looking and they're not looking. So they know exactly where to hide their stuff. And also... You know, if the inmate's not secured, it could pose a threat. If you're getting close to that contraband and that inmate doesn't want that discovered, there's going to be a fight, especially if some of these inmates, they could be disciplined by their gang if the contraband gets found. If they wind up, if we wind up finding drugs that they're supposed to distribute, well, they're not going to want to give that up lightly because in the end, if we find that and they can't distribute it, they're going to get a hit on them or they're going to get some type of sanction that they have to deal with. So they're going to try to put up an effort. But uh, Russ, what about those states that have the inmates watch us do our searches? Yeah, that's uh, that. Those particular policies are born out of ignorance, because, um, like you said, yeah, you know, good good point on the on you know uh, getting caught with the drugs and not putting up a fight. You're usually um, a lot of these places. They're actually required to try and stab the officer if possible. Um, another thing that happens a lot of times is is they don't have to interfere directly with what an officer is doing. They simply have to give the right signal and somewhere not even in that unit across the yard, a fight with several inmates will start. What's going to happen? Well, you're going to have to respond, right? And so that's one reason why we don't want inmates looking at what we're doing. We don't want them to be able to signal things and, and have violence kick off and interfere with what we're doing and become aggressive and, uh, you know, try and, you know, challenge us in, in the midst of our search and hoping that we'll lay off a little a little bit. So, uh, you know, there's no reason that an inmate should ever have more than a couple hundred dollars at the most of property. And even that's too much. So is there any reason for them to watch their property? None whatsoever. You know, if they want to if they want to have like one specific envelope uh, dedicated to their um to their to their legal work, so be it. We can search that without reading everything that's in there. We can uh, run it through a metal detector. We can uh, dab it with, uh, you know, to check it in an ion scanner to make sure that it's not holding any dope, and send them out the door. 
and then go and do what we do and uh, not have bad policy, uh, you know, that makes the situations that we're in on a day to day basis even worse. Uh, you know, people may not think that uh, dope is a huge issue, but it is because dope is the only method by which STGs are able to exercise and leverage uh, violence throughout an entire system. That's the only way they, they do it because they get money for that. And they, on average, probably get about 10 times uh, what it goes for on the streets. And uh, it allows them to be able to hold great sway over huge numbers of inmates. So, um, you know, if, if I've got any people out there who are well-connected and, you know, high in the chain, if you're doing some of the silly things with regards to searches like that, you should check yourself and, you know, get some input on what's really going on and why inmates are so serious about their property. It's not because it's not because of some love letters that they have in there. It's about the amount of dope that they're moving. It's about how they're connected to those STGs. And it's about having a way to be able to keep things safe for themselves that creates serious uh, safety concerns inside our institutions. I want to be safe. I want all the inmates to be safe and I want all the public to be safe all at the same time. And so if you're involved in making some bad policy like that, you're not helping people like me. Yeah. And guys, great question by Natalie. Uh, can you discuss how inmates pass contraband around? Well, I could, I'll do a few and then Russ could do one. Obviously the first thing are going to be the supporters <laughs> or the trustees, the inmates that are assigned to units that, you know, maybe they clean, they, uh, help, uh, uh, officers distribute stuff. You know, they have access to uh, more areas of the facility, your paralegals. So any inmate that has a job that gives them more access to the facility, you can even have uh, social service aides, uh, educational aides, any inmate that can move beyond their assigned unit. That's one thing. Porters have access to the, you know, many areas in which they could pick up stuff and transfer stuff over. And you also have so some facilities still have a lot of centralized areas where inmates can meet from different units, like chapels, school, uh, where they eat, mess halls, you know, uh, you know, the list goes on where they do programming and counseling. So if you're not checking these inmates as they go through certain points, then the problem is it opens up the door for them to pass things onto inmates that are in other units. Now, the best way to kind of control the spread of contraband is or or even weapons whatever it is is you have to understand uh like where where are your biggest targets i know for weapons the kitchen's always going to be a concern so let's talk about the kitchen you know the kitchen's going to give the inmates access to a lot of metal you know a lot of things they can make weapons from and the thing what you want to do with the kitchen is what i like to do is you try to make sure that the inmates that work the kitchen are living in a certain area that's a designated housing unit. So God forbid you're missing a tool and it gets discovered later that you're missing a tool. It can only go from point A to point B. If you have inmates that are working in the kitchen that live in all these different housing units, it's going to be hard to track where that weapon or where that potential tool is missing because inmates go, have different areas. So again, when you have a job that does put the inmate uh, or does give the inmate access to tools that can later become weapons, even a maintenance inmate. <clears throat> Think about this, guys. Maintenance inmates have access to tons of uh, tools that could probably even help them escape. So you want to do whatever you can to make sure that those maintenance workers are coming from a specific area. So if something goes missing, you can track, you know, exactly. It's got to it be in between these two points because the last thing you want is to be scrambling because all the inmates you know, or assigned to different units, and now you have a tool that's missing and you don't know where that tool would be. Uh, what's your thoughts, Russ? What are other methods to pass contraband? Staff? Yeah, so, so the main thing that you, have to, that you have to think about with regards to contraband is um, in order for there to be contraband, there has to be a conduit. There has to be a way for it to get in. Sometimes that's going to be through staff. Sometimes that's going to be through visitors. Sometimes that's going to be through drones. Uh, sometimes that's going to be through, uh, through you know, maybe vehicle traffic that comes in where, you know, uh, things are being attached to these vehicles surreptitiously uh, by inmates or people helping them out there. And some point along the way, 
uh, inmates are able to access that. Um, you know, it just depends. Every institution is different. Um, you know, uh, you see some of those things with regards to the vehicles maybe happen more on some of the lower level yards, but everything has to start with a conduit. And so uh, that's where you have to, you know, try and, you know, focus your attention on. Um, sometimes things come in in the most legitimate of ways, the, the trays that are in the kitchen, the wire whisks. Um, that are in there, uh, you know, pieces of the building that were, you know, originally constructed back whenever the prison was first uh, done and conceived. All of those things, you know, can be broken loose, altered, uh, and manufactured into into different ki- types of weapons, etc. Um, but we, what we really have to do is we just have to try and be as effective as we can be at removing the big ones, which for me is the dope and the cell phones, because those lead to other crimes. Those lead to, you know, potentially putting hits on other inmates, putting hits on staff, putting hits on the public, um, and being able to, you know, have that far reach from one prison to another prison where we can have a shot caller order somebody else to be killed at another facility. Well, how do they do that? Well, because they have juice, they have power, and all of that power is almost exclusively derived from the proceeds and sales of illegal substances. Yeah, and and guys, so I know as we're explaining this, it looks like inmates have a lot of freedom. Uh, You know, usually facilities, prisons, and jails are very self-sustaining. You know, we do have the inmates that are out there that are supposed to be under custody escort, especially the inmates that are minimum levels, the ones that may go out on work details outside of the facility. Uh, Those are ones that, you know, you really want to have your eyes on them. But mind you, they should be going through processes before they leave and before they enter back in the facility, which would include strips and going through a boss chair, make sure there's nothing metal. Um, Some of the inmates that are in men, not all of them, but some of the inmates that are looking to transition to that halfway house, some of them are going to do the right thing because they don't want to get caught up. They don't want to lose that opportunity to go out. You know, it depends. It depends on the influence that uh, could pressure them to do the wrong thing. But I, I, you know, I I know of inmates that will be out on a, you know, some highway detail and they'll find something and they'll call the officer real quick to let them know, Hey, um, look what I just saw here. And the officer will do what they can to radio it in and you know, whatnot. But uh, again, you know, it's, it's a self-sustaining system, you know, uh, because of the amount of work it takes to run a facility. You know, so you're right. There is some cost saving measures. I agree. But in the process, some of the jobs also teach inmates a trade, you know, it's like culinary arts. I mean, the reason why you have inmates cooking is because they're part of a culinary arts program, you know, maintenance too. The reason why you may have inmates in maintenance is because they could be part of some vocational training. So again, you know, what we need to do is always balance that out, you know, so the more an inmate could be exposed to something that could be a threat, uh, is when you have custody that's supposed to supplement that. And it is a lot of pressure on custody. It is. Because if any moment they're complacent, you know, the inmates will take advantage and a tool will become a weapon, you know, 100% if they're not, if they don't have their eyes on it. So, I mean, but again, these are things that we have to offer because you, you, you have to, the way the system works now is that you got to prepare these inmates to transition to the outside. So you, you, you got to try to introduce them to things that they're going to need in the outside world. So vocational training, you know, whatever it is, plumbing, electrician, culinary arts, you know, whatever it is to give them that true smooth transition. So when they go out, they have a skill and then hopefully they can find a job that relates to that skill. Um, they said, do CEOs on duty get tired of staff incident reports? <laughs> you know that? Yeah, I mean. Again, Russ, you want to comment on that, Russ? Yeah. Um, you know, um, sometimes, you know, you'll just have one of those days. I, um, You know, I've had, I think my best, and maybe I shouldn't say it that way, but uh, I think I had like five separate incidents in, in one day, one time. Um, it, 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 can, it can be wearing on you. And then sometimes, though, you'll have you'll have a, a, a series of days or weeks where really not much is going on. And so it's kind of nice to, you know, have a report to do here and there. Uh, it's just kind of, you know, all all different. And so, uh, yeah, there's there's places with uh, with excessive. I mean, I would say excessive amounts of uh, of 
uh, codes, if you want to call them that. Um, I usually call them call them incidents. Um, we had uh, specific uh, criteria that you had to that had to be met for an incident to be called an incident. Um, so, and th those things, you know, are always of a you know a more dangerous nature um, usually. And so, um, yeah, you can definitely get worn out. Um, you can especially get worn out. Um, even if not too much is happening, if you're there day after day for 16 hours, let me tell you, that takes a, that takes a toll on the body. Um, and you, you know, if you're there for however many days at 16 hours, and then that just goes on week after week, after week, after week, um, it can be, um, debilitating to you. Um, but you know what, there are a lot of people that do the job and, and deal with it. And, um, I think that probably letting people get too tired is unsafe and unwise for uh, administrators and management to do. And they should be trying ways, they should be trying to find ways to fill positions and, and uh, decrease uh, the number of incidents. But, um, you know, it is what it is. Yeah, I, I agree with Wisconsinite. So, so the jail systems are usually set up with layers of high <laughs> restriction to the lowest restriction. So I don't know how, you know, different states will call them different levels. Uh, maybe the higher number, the highest level of restriction, lowest number, the least amount. Uh, certain states, it's just simply defined, immediate, uh, high, close level, all the way down to minimum. And these are inmates that will have worked uh, their way down, hopefully through some level of trust where you start giving them more and more in an effort to transition them. Now, even lifers are sometimes given that opportunity because you never know. You know, sentences could get overturned, so you can't deny an inmate something uh, because, you know, you may feel that they're not getting out again because most of the time, believe it or not, keeping them busy behind the wall does make our job a bit safer, especially if you have a real good working, especially if you have a real good working relationship between custody and civilian staff. If you have a good working relationship with them both, then you can see that there's something fluid. You know, you can actually see that. Uh, I'll wait for us to come back. I think we lost them for a second. Um, you actually see that there's something fluid with that partnership. Uh, but having said that, we spend most of our time, you know, making sure that the environment's safe so rehabilitation can occur. And that's kind of like where the black eye is from the outside. The, the outside doesn't understand the effort we put into the work that we do behind the wall to, you know, uh, get inmates on the right track. And as Wisconsinite is correct on a lot of what she's saying, some of these efforts put us at risk. I mean, think about the stuff that we're exposing inmates to just to give them some level of vocational training or culinary arts, you know, and then you're going to have inmates that may manipulate certain things so they can get what they need uh, for whatever reason. Like maybe I'll join culinary arts to get closer to getting some contraband, you know, because, again, you know, you have a lot of inmates that come from different areas that could be working there. And, you know, you, you want to set up something for the right reasons, but good intent can easily get manipulated behind that wall. So all because you may have something, one, is doesn't mean they want it, or two, doesn't mean they want it for the right reasons. You know, so we could provide the effort all day. But the, the key is, is even when someone wants to take it, we're still always going to be wary of the motive. You know, why do you want to take this? You know, and you really have to exhaust all efforts. And I, and I think the big thing right now about this all, too, is that on the outside, you know, they, they look for outcome, 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 outcome. You know, sometimes you're going to be people that you could do effort, 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 and they're just not, just don't want to change. It is what it is. And then you have to make a decision. Do I devote all my resources to the one person that's just not ready for change? And I'll say ready because I'm going to look for some potential later on. But right now, do I devote all my resources to someone who's not ready to change? Or I have people waiting in the wings right now. I got people that are ready to go. I mean, am I going to spend all my time on one individual who's not ready? Or am I going to focus on the other 30 who I can get moving? And, and that's where you have to kind of roll your dice. And uh, uh, a good question by uh, Sarah is, um, how many COs are on schedule? Do COs have to take additional training to be ahead of inmate games? I'll start first, Russ. You just came in and I'll pass it over to you. But okay, it, it really does depend on the facility. So that's a very hard question to answer. I mean, right now I could tell you that a lot of facilities are understaffed. So even what they're supposed to have in their FTE, which is their full-time employment, may not be met. 
So they'll start cutting posts and, you know, instead of two officers on one post, they'll make it one. And, and then the sad thing is, is if it's not challenged every day, that becomes the, the norm, which you don't want. You don't want the, the practice of operating under to be that norm. So it's something that you do have to challenge. Like, okay, it's been my fifth week now where there's only one officer in the dorm. There should be two. Okay, we'll write it every day. Don't just stop and accept it because the moment you don't continue to write that you're under post, you know, that you should have one more person is the moment where we start to accept that practice. And there's another part of that question that Sierra asked. Um, where is it? Let me get it. That uh, Do CEOs have to take additional training to be ahead of inmate games? Well, here's the thing, guys. I want to add on that. Um, so real quick, I wrote this book. Let's just say, for example, Inmate Manipulation Decoded, right? Now, Granted, uh, when shit hits the fan, the the agencies, I'm sure the agencies in Alabama right now, uh, you know, you know, I'm sure that liability wise, they're going to have to put people for some level of training, 100 percent. Right. Because we know something occurred and now we have to get into that reactionary preventive mode. That's what I like to say, you know, the speed and the reaction and effort to prevent uh, so it doesn't happen again. But I will say this, guys, I will say this. When you work a housing unit and you're doing your rounds and you see a, a popular book being passed around by the inmates, like in one case, one of the books was 48 Laws of Power, you know, and you see all the inmates that are reading that book. I think, yes, the agency should be giving you some level of training. But if you're working in corrections, you also have to be intentional with your growth as well. If you're not intentional, the inmates are going to grow past you. And don't get me wrong. They'll play dumb sometimes or because they ask you a question doesn't mean they don't know the answer, but it's always going to be a test. And I think in corrections, you can't always rely on the agency to take you to that next level. That's why we do the show tier talk. That's why Russ has the keepers of chaos, the mentoring program. If you rely on the agency to send you to your next class, well, that's your fault. You know, if you know coming in that this job is about life and death, you know, and you want to be the best you can be because it's not really a job, it's a career, then you invest in everything. If I showed you the books that are behind me, you know, when I got into a leadership position, my agency may only send me to, let's say, one or two classes. That's not enough to lead. I'm going to go ahead and read stuff on my own because I want to be the best at what I what it is that I do. So I think part of that is, yes, the agency should be sending you out, but don't wait for them to do that. Step up, be intentional with your growth. And if you see, like, as I said, the inmates are constantly reading, they're constantly educating yourself. And a lot of these guys, you know, you get these inmates that are constantly working out and some of the staff want to be as big as those inmates because they want to match that testosterone. But not a lot of staff want to, you know, you know, read those books that those inmates are reading, trying to match the, the level of ingenuity. Uh, I mean, there are females that were reading books on how to manipulate men, you know, and then once you see that book in your unit and you can't take the book away, because supposedly it's in their right to have that book, then what do you got to do? I'm going to have to read that book. Because if I can't take the book away, then I'm going to have to read it because at any time that book could be employed against me. What's your thoughts on that, Russ? Uh, yeah, in, in California, we have a banned book reading list. And of course, everything's on it. Like, uh, you know, the 48 Laws of Power, the Turner Diaries, uh, a lot of different things. Uh, as a matter of fact, every book that comes in, in my in my opinion, and I don't know, they, they could have changed things. Now, there should be a clear greeting list where only certain books are on it because uh, we just don't know. Um, we don't have enough time to, you know, look into everything that, that's out there. So uh, anyway, absolutely. Um, you know, uh, there's too many um, there's too many political footballs happening with regards to uh, us getting kicked around um, by the politicians who, you know, magically they know better how to run things than we do. And so, you know, we need to really work at taking those things back. We're the experts at this. Um, we should be the ones making those decisions. And Anthony, I got one story to tell him. I'm going to have to cut out of here. I do have a little bit of a semi sort of urgent situation that I got to take care of with my mother-in-law. Okay. All right. So do what you got to do. You want, you said you have a story before you go. I, I, I have a story. I told one of the, the, one of the, there's, there's a guy in our, in our audience there named big whiskey. And I said that I had, I told him that I would tell a story about that term big whiskey. So um, I was at the at the last adult institution that I worked at, 
um, we had a we had a guy there. Now I'm not going to say his name because he he was an inmate. Uh, but anyway, he was left in this uh, in this fenced area that's outside the perimeter. And anyway, he managed to uh, cut his way through the fenced area and skedaddle on us, right? And so anyway, he was gone for probably several days and we were getting ready to close down the whole um, escape, uh, you know, the escape pursuit plan that we had going because no one had seen him. But uh, anyway, uh, this one particular morning, I was on my way in and I was almost to the institution and there was this house on the side of the road that was going up in flames like a Roman candle. And anyway, this house curiously had a name and everyone used to call it the Big Whiskey. And so uh, anyway, and it got that name because quite a few different um, uh, movie stars used to stay there and stuff. And uh, one of the movie stars was a guy you may have heard of called Clint Eastwood. And Clint Eastwood dubbed this house the Big Whiskey. I don't know the backstory on that or whatever, but uh, moving along to this story that actually has uh kind of a point to it so i pulled up into the institution and i went in there to where they had the where they had the escape pursuit uh office going on and stuff and i said hey did you guys see that that house is burning down and people were yeah we saw it i said well i don't believe in coincidences do you i said you guys we should put a perimeter around that and everyone just he's gone he's not around here anywhere right so like another week goes by, right? Uh, maybe even a little bit longer than that. And our cert team gets called out to this uh, firehouse that's on the other side of the highway from where Big Whiskey was. And anyway, uh, they got a tip that this guy was hiding out in this volunteer firehouse where, of course, there was no one else in there. And so they went in there and they managed to get him and everything. Guess what he had? He had... Uh, stolen stuff from inside the big whiskey house and so that just goes to show you you know uh you never should take anything for granted there are no coincidences especially in corrections and in that case um our institution lost a big uh lawsuit um by the homeowner with regards to that because apparently this guy was in there and uh yes he lit the fire he burned the house down and, uh, you know, somehow in all of that, uh, it got missed and people just decided he's gone. And so we get back to that thing I talk about all the time, complacency, right? Complacency, situational awareness perceived, but not achieved. Everybody thought he was gone and he wasn't. So we lost that, uh, we lost that particular lawsuit and, uh, you know what? Lessons learned, lesson learned. Anyway, I got to go guys. So anyway, uh, Anthony's going to wrap all of this up for you, and I'm going to look at uh, what the rest of it is. Uh, got anything for me, Anthony, that I need to answer before I head out? No, we're good, Ross. Go ahead. Do what you got to do. All right. So anyway, it was a pleasure and an honor to uh, get to talk to all of you and to answer questions. And uh, everyone, just stay safe out there. Hi, Ross. All right, let me... So, guys, uh, you know, I'm going to see Eric probably soon, too. I'm going to see him at Masca. But, guys, I, what, I want, what I want to try to do is now that I have the opportunity, uh, you know, with people from the outside looking in, I do want to give you guys a connection to what happens behind the wall. You know, instead of you guys going to the media, you know, you can go to the people that have experience and get information that actually matters. Because the scary thing is, guys, a lot of the changes that Corrections is facing are changes that are really done by people who don't know what it's like behind the wall. So, you know, being able to provide that information, you never know. You know, finally, people may get a chance to understand a little bit more about what's happening behind the wall. So for you guys to take the time out of your busy day to kind of chill out with us and let us talk shop a little bit, I think that's pretty awesome. I'm going to do my best to make sure I get more people from the field. But, but guys, I, I want you to know something. It, it's not so much about the profession, guys, because when you watch the videos I have here, it's not – you know, what we what we talk about it doesn't always specifically have to apply to prisons and jails. I think what's good about what we do is where I think what's good about what we do is that we actually do stuff that could apply elsewhere. You know, not not just in the prison setting, but in our daily lives, there's there's application to what we provide. 
And I think that truly does matter. And what you guys are doing now is you're connecting with the people that work the profession, the people that usually go unnoticed. And you're starting to realize that we, let's say we have Joe Pompano, you're calling him Joe. You know, you're connecting to the person. You're calling me Anthony. You're calling Russ, Russ. You know, you're connecting to the people and you're trusting us into giving you that perspective of a profession that's in the dark. You know, and that's a crazy trust because I'll tell you why it's a crazy trust. It's a crazy trust because when you work in a profession that's in the dark, you have, it's harder for you to challenge our perspective because again, there's no other perspective except what that media provides, which isn't a hundred percent. So when you're coming at us and you're you're asking the questions and we're giving you the answers, I, I, I'm humbled by that because that means that you're trusting us on this crazy level. I mean, you have no idea how much that matters to us because in the end, that's what we want to do. We want to create an influence in the real world because at the end, you know, guys, real quick, when, when, when Tear Talk first started almost a decade ago, it was a matter of getting the voice out to the public. You know, because they, they ridiculed what we did. They didn't know what we did. So I, I wanted to provide a venue in which we can express our concerns. And then the sad thing is, even when I did that and we had the chance where the public would listen, we ourselves have became so disenfranchised that even when the public was willing to listen, we ourselves would bastardize our profession. So now it's like, well, why am I even doing this if we ourselves don't believe in the work we do? So that shifted. We went inside out. You know, we said, hey, you know what? We got to try it from a different route, you know, and we, we got to try to get us to find value in this profession, find purpose. And then now, now when you get the person that has value and purpose in this profession, now when they talk to someone from the outside, it's a very engaging dialogue. You know, it's passion. And, and, and then for people that want to listen, I've been at a lot of parties and we could sit and chat. And the moment you mentioned that you work in corrections, everybody becomes all ears. So you know that there's an interest and that's your opportunity to be intentional and shed some positive light on this profession because there is good. And, and, and to be able to do that with you guys, uh, it, it, it's, it's humbling. It's actually addicting. I mean, it really is addicting. Um, let me see if I can get one more question or two. How do they determine which inmates go out to clean expressways, et cetera? Do they get certain privileges or can they get released sooner for good behavior? Uh, so I can answer one or two. So, there's usually a, a classification process. Each facility is going to have its own criteria that the inmate must meet. Uh, if you're having an inmate that's going out to the community, you don't want really any restraining orders. Um, you know, I mean, it really is depending specific on the facility. I mean, some facilities will allow people that are lifers to go out there, which I don't think is always the best bet. Um, I think that that's not maybe if the, if the person doesn't get parole, doesn't get something, they could always jump. But each facility is going to have their own criteria that usually should be seen by some committee to determine in a collective manner if, th if this person poses a greater risk. Now, mind you guys, mind you, the filter gives us a, a good criteria, but people can always be impulsive. You can have an inmate that has a perfect record. You put them out there and they find out some news about their girlfriend on the streets and they just jump and go. You know, so you could have a perfect system, but you're not going to be able to control impulsive actions. So I want people to know that. Like, I mean, there's going to be no perfect system because you're overseeing human behavior. So there's no way you're going to have a system that's going to be able to cover every possible scenario because the more you create systems, the more they're able to figure out a way to work around it. You know, so I wish you had all these ultimate fail safes, um, but, you know, there's always going to be a way, you know, for an inmate that's crafty or that is motivated uh, you know, to go ahead and, and, and make an effort to get through uh, and break away from those boundaries that we hope we put in place. Um, let me see. Hold on. There's a few more. Amazing bridge between. Oh, thank you, Sherilyn. I appreciate that, you know, and uh, correction is not an easy job. Mad salute. To oh, thank you. Well, I really appreciate it. I can only imagine the crazy things you've seen. You know, what's funny. You know, you know, what's funny. It, it, I, in my career, I, I'm not going to say I haven't seen crazy things. I have, uh, but not as much as people think. I'm not going to sit there and lie to you and tell you that, you know, every day I see crazy things and it, it, it's not. It, it, I mean, there are moments, yes. I mean, you know, that it's like, wow, I can't believe someone would even do that. Um, but the one thing that I try not to do 
is I always try to not normalize the abnormal. Um, you know, I, I remember an incident in 2006 where there was a moment where the profession may have gotten to me. Um, my, my nephew uh, killed himself back in 2006. It was unexpected. And when the service occurred, at the time, I had worked in corrections for a few years already, and we had a string of suicide attempts. And we kind of kind of got used to it at one point. It was like an expected day. And when my nephew had taken his own life because of the suicide, I couldn't find the emotion that it should have warranted because of me getting used to the suicides at the facility. I found everybody else very upset. He was a young kid, you know, very upset. Uh, my brother being the worst of all, of course, it's his son, but I couldn't get the emotion. I just couldn't feel the emotion. And my response to what he did was literally insulting. He's an idiot. He shouldn't have done it. And I was like, wow. But I checked myself immediately because I looked at everybody around me and I saw how they were reacting. Oh, thank you, William. I appreciate that. And I said, maybe there's something wrong with me. But mind you guys, that takes tremendous insight. I mean, that, that's easier said than done, but that's just who I've always been. You know, I, I look at everybody else. You know, I look at myself and, you know, it's just I'm insightful. You know, I'm always asking myself why 20 times over. Thank you, Karen. Um, you know, so, you know, once you feel that shift, but, but mind you guys, you have to, and this is just in anything outside of corrections too. Shifts are slow and subtle. So if you don't know yourself to that intimate level, you're not going to recognize those small and subtle, subtle shifts. I mean, you really have to know yourself at a very intimate level to recognize those slow and subtle shifts that are happening every day. Because if you don't, then finally you explode or something happens and you have no idea what the hell happened. You know, so sometimes it's always good to check yourself. You know, I mean, every time I'm going, every time I'm leaving a prison or going into a prison or whatever it is, I'm always checking myself, making sure I don't have anything that I'm not supposed to have to go in and I'm not taking anything I'm not supposed to have out, you know? And I think the same thing goes with your mindset. You know, I think the same thing goes with your mindset. You have to know everything about yourself because if you don't, hold on one second, guys, bear with me. It's hot in here. Hold on. My nose is dripping. Um, if you don't know everything about yourself, this profession can change you. But, but, but again, I don't think that's just corrections either. I don't think that's just corrections, guys. If you watch the videos I do, the videos that we put up, and, and thank you, uh, Julie, I appreciate that. If you watch that, they, they relate to just people. I mean, think about that. The corrections profession is just dealing with people. You know, I, I'm going to tell you something. I've had moments in this profession that I'll never forget that were good moments. Moments that I've been exposed to that I would have never had those moments if I've not gotten into corrections. I mean, to have interactions with lives that I would normally ignore. I would normally walk away from. And then now you're, you're put in a prison where you're forced to have this interaction. And you know, that's another thing about the magic of corrections. If you take advantage of it, if you take advantage of it, you're going to have these forced interactions with people that you normally wouldn't have these interactions with. They normally wouldn't have that interaction with you. And that's a tremendous gift that this profession can give you if you take advantage of it. I mean, think about it. How many people walk through the projects that could probably create a difference in someone's life, but they're too afraid to walk up, so they ignore people. It's like, nah, I'm not going to go in there. I'm not, you know, I, I know I can have an influence on them, but nah, it's too scary to do that. It's too scary to do that. But now here we are in the prison setting where you have to do it. You have to have that interaction. So now that person that could have had a positive interaction on the street may be given that chance to have a positive interaction here inside the prison. You know, a lot of the officers that work corrections don't believe that they can have that positive interaction. That's the scary thing. They don't believe that they're supposed to have that positive interaction, but corrections has shifted. You know, I, I believe that there is a greater service to others. It doesn't soften my perspective. Like, I, I know the people I'm dealing with. I'm not a fool. I know it. But I also know that eventually 
if I'm planning on having some level of value in my life and some level of service to others, you know, if there's a chance to have a positive interaction within the control boundaries of my prescribed role, why not take advantage of that? I've done that. I, I, I've talking to people that were never given a positive expectation in their life. Never. I mean, literally never. They don't even know what a positive expectation is. And then you tell them that there's a chance that they can live that. There's a chance that they can reach that. You know, and then they make the effort to try. There's something good about that at the end. I mean, think about it, guys. Among, in corrections, it's easy to passively see negative and, 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 and take that home. Or you can go in and say, you know, I'm going to try to do something positive today. You know, it doesn't blind me from my role of, of what has to be done. You know, people are like, well, Ganji, you got to be careful when you talk to me. Universal precaution, universal precaution. Yeah, but universal precaution doesn't mean to stop. It means to slow down. That's all. It doesn't mean you stop interacting. It means just go, go with a little bit more caution. You know, go with a little bit more caution. You know, and, and granted, there, there could be inmates that are out there to manipulate, and we get that. We get that. But you're in control of the dialogue. They can only manipulate you if you allow it. But that doesn't mean you don't have dialogue. That means you have to have dialogue, but have control of the dialogue. You know, Sherilyn says making a difference is what it's all about. No matter how crazy some things seem, it's about good people influencing people that can learn and change. And and, and, and I, I agree with that, guys. I do. I, I, I think in the end, there is a greater purpose here. And I think that corrections is evolving. I'm not going to, as I said, I told people in an earlier show today, I'm not going to say change. Because change makes us weary. Change makes us wonder what we've done wrong and, you know, you know, question our past. And, you know, now we're going in this new thing new. It's like, no, guys, we're evolving. That means that every move forward is based on what you've done in the past, successes and failures. And right now, corrections is shifting to a world that's balanced. It's, it's, it's going to have a template, yes, of safety and security, but you're going to introduce the rehabilitation concept. And then you find people that are extremely passionate coming into this profession who want to have an impact. And guys, their impact is sincere because the impact is not for recognition, not in a prison. You know, they're trying every day. I mean, they are. I see the work that, that gets done behind the wall. And I know they're making the effort. I see it. You feel it. And at the end of the day, you get people that become disenfranchised because, you know, maybe they're thinking that they can change all 50 in their class. And it's like, yeah, you, you know, I don't know if that's possible, but you can try for one. Don't try to shoot for all 50 because then you're going to be, you're not going to be consistent. You're going to be all over the place, but shoot for one. And if you shoot for one, that message may have enough power to bring the other 49 in. But if not, one is better than none. You know, one is better than none. And then, and then when these people have a chance to highlight the good work that's being done behind the wall, people don't promote that. I mean, that's a big part of what frustrates me uh, when it comes to the outside looking in. I mean, they're quick to take a negative interaction and generalize it out as if that's the practices across the country. And then when you're sitting in the profession, you're like, man, but that's not what we did. But yet we're being treated as if we did it. So instead of holding the person who did it accountable, what are you doing? You're holding a whole professional accountable. And now you're changing policies and procedures and and and, and basically off of one person who did something wrong, but now we're all being punished off that. And then the problem is there's that negative label now. Now there's that negative label. You've attached us to that one person who fucked up. But mind you, when, I, I grant that you're going to have bad people in every profession, but that one incident, guys, if you think about 800 potential staff that work in corrections, 800,000, 800,000, thousands of inmates or millions of inmates locked up, you have any interactions that are happening every day that are positive, that don't get shown? You're telling me one negative interaction outweighs all the rest? That's insane. And for people not to be willing to take their time and effort, like when, when someone comes up and says, yeah, you heard what happened the other day that I didn't make blah, blah, blah. We could be able to come up and say, oh, that's a shame. But you know what? Hey, guess what? I got 10 stories about this that happened that was positive from 10 different facilities. Yeah, we're not going to worry about that now, Ganji. We just want to focus on that. So you want to focus on the one negative, use that to fit your agenda. But I have 10 positive stories right now. 
You know, again, I'm not minimizing what this person did, but I got 10 good stories right now that you guys don't want to hear because it doesn't fit with the agenda. Now, I wish we could open up the prison and let you guys see the work that goes on, but this is the best we can do. You know, the best I can do is I can introduce you to people and maybe it's not a bad thing because you get to connect with the people that bring you into the profession. So think about how powerful that is. Because once you start seeing us as, as, as good people, then that's a great way to sort of look at how to define what we do. Because I'm going to tell you something, it, the way the public defines what we do, I would never be in this profession. There's no value if that's what happened. But then yet here I am, people like me, people like Russ, people like Connie. If the profession of corrections was exactly what the media said, you wouldn't have people like us in this profession. It would serve no purpose. Actually, that's why we're more motivated to do what we do. Because there's more of us than there is of that negative stigma. So, you know, it's great to be able to go to the outside and let the outside see that. Because, again, sometimes when we go to defend this profession, we feel that we're alone. You know, we stand alone because we don't have outside support. You know, so it's great to know that now we have this venue, people are coming up, and now it just it motivates us to create more. And, and your curiosity is amazing. It's amazing. I mean, you guys are into the, the dialogue, and you can tell by the questions that you're asking. And I make sure if I can get it, I, I get those questions out so we can answer them. But you guys are asking questions because you're interested in what we're doing. We never had that before, ever. You know, so it's great to know that you guys not only care so much to listen, but to ask questions to get a better understanding. And somewhere along the line, I know that you're finding some way to apply it. Maybe there could be one moment where someone goes to bastardize the system and you guys can speak. Or you guys can send them to this channel, whatever it is. But the ripple effect could be extremely powerful. And literally, guys, it starts with one person. It started with me, let's say. In, in, in 2014 or 15 or whatever it was, just got tired. And now here I am. And now, look, 20-something thousand subscribers, a mix of the outside and the in. Uh, but it only took one person to say I had enough. So, I mean, think about the power someone can create. If all they do is do it. I mean, think about the people right now that could be influencers. And, you know, I, I love what I do, Gange. And I was thinking about what you do. And, you know, I may not work in corrections, but I would love to be an influencer. But, you know, I don't know. Can I? You know that. The question is, do you want to? Yes. Do you feel you can have an impact? Yes. Then you have to do it. There's no ifs and buts about it. Because if you're not doing it, someone else will. You know, you ever been in a class and you see this instructor and they're teaching you like, man, I could do that. I could do exactly what that person's doing. Well, why aren't you doing it? Well, I don't know if it's for me, but yet you want to do it. The world's not going to come to you. There's too many people that have voices now. You can't expect to do something and the world's going to find you. You got to be aggressive. You got to go out there and put your mouth out there. You got to go speak. You got to go to the highest mountaintop and scream. Because there's so many voices out there, you can't expect anybody to find you in this day and age. And, and I'm going to tell you something. If you're not preaching the good message, somebody else will be preaching the wrong message. And then now you're allowing that to happen. Because if you know that you have a powerful voice and you can have an influence and you can change lives and you don't get involved in that and you allow other people to step up and take the mic and do it, I blame you now. Well, Ganji, I'm just not ready. Then start and become ready. No one says you have to be perfect. I started on a cell phone. I just bought a computer the other day. You know, there's no perfection. It's about your voice. It's about your message. People connect to the message. I'm, I'm shooting the shit out of my basement. You know, but that doesn't negate the power and the message, if you're willing to look into it. You know, so as I'm saying, for people that, regardless of the, of the profession, if you feel that you have a voice, I don't care if it's just to one person. You know, Get it out there. Change the world. Because in the end, you can't expect people to find you unless you're out there doing it. And that's the key for me. I could have sat there and, you know, not started tear talk and waited for people to come to me. And I could have just said, you know what? One person at a time. Or I could say, you know what? I'm going to go to them. I'm going to go to them, change their perspective. And now what? Conferences I'm doing and 
just living life, creating a good message. And I think that's the key. And in closing, guys, I just love this community. I, I really do. So I'm going to go to California. I'm leaving. Actually, I actually have a 5 a.m. 5 a.m. Well, 8.30 flight, but I'm going to get up at 5 a.m. I like to get up early. Um, so when I get to California, maybe I'll do another live. Um, love you guys, man. I mean, this is why we do it, though. You know what's funny, guys? So the people that make these beautiful comments in here, it's motivating. But it's motivating to the point where it's inspiring. Because I'm connecting to you guys. I'm feeling you guys a lot. So the cool thing about it is you guys are doing more than just motivating me. You guys are inspiring me. And I think that's great. I think that even, even with my, my kids, you know, I spend a lot of time with them as well. I got the two girls. But I think that they're going to see something when this is all said and done. You know, maybe when I'm long past, it, it creates that legacy. You know, at the end of the day, it's not even so much about the profession. It's about a person that wouldn't give up. You know, and I think that's the key. And I, and I think that's something that my kids could admire. I think that's something that the correction profession admires, you know, because we don't give up. You know, I think that's something that, you know, any profession, you know, it, it's effort, guys, not so much the outcome. It's always effort. I'm a big believer in that. And I'm going to tell people that uh, at the conference, guys, we work, we, we live in a society that's very outcome driven. Outcome driven is like an I culture. It's like you're only judged by the outcomes you bring. And it's like, really? Because the outcome is, 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 is brief. It's, it's the effort before that. So you're only judging me based on the outcome and you're minimizing the effort regardless of the outcome, you know? And, 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 and for me, it's all about that effort. You know, I'm not going to win every fight, but I want my child or my children to know that I'm willing to fight. Same thing in corrections. You're not going to win every code. You know, you, it may, may get the best of you at one moment. But that doesn't mean you stop fighting. You continue with that effort. I would love one day for us to switch the world from an outcome-driven culture to an effort-driven culture. And then maybe politicians would want, instead of saying promises, they would just commitment. And you know what's good about that, guys? When you build trust with the people, with your audience, when people start to trust you, they'll trust your effort. Because they know that you've tried. But if people don't trust you, they want outcome. And that's the truth. If I don't trust you, I want outcome. But if I trust you, I'm willing to accept effort. Because I know you tried. And I would love to get to a part in this world where we are not solely judged by outcome. I would love to get to a part where people actually start respecting the effort. And I think that comes in just all aspects of life. But got to get some rest. I'm Hopefully, I'll see you guys. I'll try to go live from, from California. Uh, we can go all day about trust, guys. I mean, guys, you got to check out the videos I have. I promise you guys. It's not, just about a, it's not just about corrections. Me and Connie dive into so many things that could be applied in so many areas of life. You know, it's, it's moving. I mean, I got my next book coming out is going to cover on a lot of stuff that, yes, it's what I learned from custody to admin. I get it. But, but guys, it, it, there's application there, you know, for anybody to pick up the book. You know, I mean, I mean, guys, there, there are so many things you can learn from someone who walked another road than you, you know, and, and it's just, a, but the magic guys in this is how you apply that. You know, I could sit, at, I could sit and read a book and say, you know what, this doesn't apply to me uh, because it's, um, yeah, let's do this one. Sorry. This doesn't apply to me because it's all about correction. So I'm not going to bother reading it. Yeah. But you know what? You don't know that unless you read it. And then you could be intentional on what you look for. You know, when people really respect, like let's say for us, people are starting to get a, a liking for, let's say, me and Connie, you're going to find ways to connect what we do to your life. Just like, you know, I would do the same. I've picked up books and I've read books of things that are not even pertaining to what I do. But I love the author. I love Robert Greene, for example. And not all his books are going to apply to me. But I'll read his books because I like him. It's my effort now to find that application. It's mine. It's not his. Remember, he wrote for one. He writes for one. So it's my effort to find where I fit in that. I tell that to the people I work with. Hey, guys, when you're doing a job, no matter how small, find the significance. Find where that job fits into the vision of what the agency wants. Because in the end, everybody has task significance, but you have to find your value within that vision. 
when I came into corrections, I knew that this is what I want to accomplish. And I found a way to fit that into the vision of my agency. Same thing here. Robert Green or whoever it is may write for an audience of one, but that's my job now to figure out how I can fit into that. Because there's always something valuable from somebody who has walked a different walk than you. All you have to do is be an intentional. Listen, I've read shitty books, but I always find one nugget. I mean, I've literally read shitty books, but I'll find a nugget. I have to be intentional with it because I'm like, I just read this book. I hope it wasn't a waste of my time. So I'll go back and try to find something. But that's on me. You know, so again, guys, there's always value if you make the effort to find it's intentional. Growth is intentional. Leaving your comfort zone to grow is intentional. But uh, I could talk all day, guys. We should do this more often. These silent one of these solo one-on-ones. I'm loving it. I could, I'm literally, guys, I could talk all day, but I really got to get some sleep. As always, guys, love you guys. Stay safe. And I'll see you guys sometime from uh, at California. I'll try to get you, I'll try to get a quick little thing off to tell you how, how I'm doing. And uh, you know what I could do one day too, is I have one of my keynote speeches. If you ever guys want to hear it, maybe I could post it up next time. It's more of a motivational thing, but it was, I think I did it when I was in Nebraska. So I think you guys may get a kick out of that one because I think it doesn't just apply to corrections. It applies to us in the real world. But as always, guys, love you guys and stay safe.